What up, everybody? Beefy Boys time, episode 28. And goddamn was last night worth every penny that I spent on it. Um, man, UFC 256 provided us with some very memorable moments and some insane bangers, some crazy finishes, some close-ass decisions. I mean, really everything you'd want from a card, it delivered. A belt was on the line. Um, there was controversy. There were storylines. There was big personalities. There was big guys. There was little guys. Badass men, badass women. I mean, very, just like I said, check box, check box, check box. Everything that I personally love in a, in a UFC card is what last night provided. Uh, we'll get beefy boy Harrison on with us shortly. Here he comes right now, actually. Oh, shit. What up? Uh, what up, bro? How's it going, man? Uh, good. We got snow out here, so I had to bring out the uh, Christmas giraffe. You know what I mean? Hell yeah, yeah. And, oh, speaking of, I'll be right back. I'll match you. I'll match For you. Sure. Christmas For sure. For anyone that's wondering, these are additional scarves my giraffe is wearing. You know, you got a long neck. Got to put two on. Got to put two on. Man, what a card last night. What an absolute, hey, we lighting it up. We're on fire. We're lit. Oh, it's lit like a Christmas tree, baby. But yeah. Man, last night, I was just saying how, like, I mean, just talk about checking every box. I mean, uh, we, we had belts. We had big guys. We had little guys. We had men. We had women. We had close finishes. We had insane, uh, I mean, close decisions and insane um, finishes. I mean, just We had box. Old, old vets that you were wanting to see. We had young guys that were on the come up. Man. I mean, it was everything, man. I was just going to say, like, every fight on this card was meaningful to the division they fight in or to the whole UFC picture as a whole. Like, every single fight. You might be able to argue one or two, but, man, like, every fight had a lot of gain or a lot of ground to be gained for whoever won. Man, and just, like, as far as, like, de delivering value to your customer, like, I oh bought, I, I actually bought last night's fights and, you yeah. know, uh, and I, I came out of it, like, happy that I paid for that. Like, I got every freaking dime, penny, like, I got, Absolutely, I mean, what more bro. can you ask for? I mean, entertainment value. I mean, Jesus Christ, that was, that was amazing. Um, I had more fun and I was watching on the sick ass, like 70 inch uh, TV with surround sound and shit up here at this lake house. So that's what's man, up. It was, it was, it was nice, man. But yeah, man, I, I mean, I was, I spent all the day yesterday snowboarding and then I like, I avoided social media all day. Like yes, sir. avoided sports radio. I turned off my ESPN notifications uh, I was like, I, I don't know. I was like isolating in the mountains. And <laughs> I, I came back and I was up late watching it, drank some, you know, vodka and monster. And, 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 and man, it was, it was an amazing, I, man, what a great card. So crazy enough, as, as great of a card as it was for all the fighters, it was great for us too, from the beefy bets perspective. Went eight yeah. and three, hit one of two parlays as well there. Um, it, it, if you did the return on investment, which I calculated last night, it was about 45%. So you would have got all your money back plus add another 45% to it. Damn. So. Yeah, man. Definitely your picks more so than mine, but I'll get hey, <laughs> it. That was amazing. I, I'll say, though, the picks that I was most confident in ended up, you know, winning, being. You Absolutely. Know, but we'll get into it. No spoilers, no spoilers. But, uh, man, I mean, started off, I mean, just even started off amazing. We had one fight on the early prelim. Um, but man, it was a hell of a fight, and I think it was closer than almost anybody expected. Way closer than I expected. Way, way, way closer. Than I think Vegas expected. Uh, for anyone mm -hmm. that's wondering, it's Chase Hooper and Peter Barrett. Uh, what did he step in the cage at as a favorite? Minus three fifty. Is that correct? It, it got down to minus three ten. Oh, okay. It's okay. So, so, so yeah. So obviously, some money was coming in on Barrett there late. Yesterday. Yeah, I and also the noticed they got down to uh, plus two fifty. That's what it was. Two fifty. Okay. I also noticed they're doing uh, DraftKings odds now for when they walk in the octagon, which I assume is just some promotion. Yeah, but they also mentioned William Hill, too. So because I, that's was, the official ESPN sportsbook. It's so weird to me that they kind of go back and forth. Yeah, they, I, I saw that. They were definitely flip-flop and trying to, like, make both sides happy, which, hey, I mean, you get your money, whatever, but how about yeah. pay some of it to the fighters? Um, no joke, man. No but, man, I, I mean, we've done a few Chase Hooper fights now, but, and I don't know how I'm just now kind of hitting me that, like, Chase Hooper's six fucking one at featherweight. That's that's nuts. He's real I, skinny, too. Like, I mean, I know he's 21. He's going to fill out. I imagine he's a guy that can't continue to make 45. He's going to have to go up. 
Yeah, once he hits like twenty five ish, he'll he'll be a lightweight. But that's cool. He, that's even tall for lightweight still. Um, but man, um, I'll say last night, you know, definitely just was like kind of sobering moment for the Chase Hooper fans. Like for sure, you know for what sure. I'm saying? Alarming, like, like, alarming a little bit. Which I thought maybe should have been already starting because he's like people like act like he's not coming off a loss. Now he's coming off a loss <laughs> to a badass dude. Um, right. Alex Caceres, but like, I mean, th- the way the hype train was being typed, hyped up, you would think the guy was seven and zero or something. Right, right. And when he, he got one and one. when he got signed to the UFC, I want to say he was four and zero. He signed a developmental deal where he had to fight three circuit fights in his region without losing, and then he would get a contract. Right. So he went two zero and one. So he was six zero and one when he came to the UFC. Uh, then he got no. He, okay, so he started five and zero. But anyway, came to the UFC at seven zero and one. Got his first win. Then got took that L and then got back in the win column last night. Yeah, so. and, and I mean I'm not trying to shit on him. I, I I I want to see this kid be a success, but you know what I'm saying? Just like I feel like the hype train was like a little out of control on on Chase. Oh, Cooper. It, it was and way it, out of control, way out in, of control. In Vegas, obviously, you know, drink the Kool Aid too. You know what I'm saying? And, and we did too. I mean, we we thought this was gonna be a um, you know, a, a, a runaway landslide, but uh. But, man, Peter Barrett fucking got off the bus, didn't he? Yeah, and his takedown defense looked tremendous. I mean, aside from Imanari rolls, which it's hard to defend those to begin with. But Those were amazing. Like, by the way, we, we'll, we'll get to the third round whenever that happened. But, my goodness, did you score either of the first two rounds for Hooper in any way? I gave, I, I gave round one to Hooper. Um, okay, I, I was I really those... close on that round. I was really it... close on that round. And it's crazy because Rogan and the guys, and, and obviously Rogan knows striking. I would never, like, call that into question. But I'm saying they were just, like, dog shitting on his striking. But I actually thought his body kicks in the first round, like, that's mainly the reason why I gave the first round to Hooper. I thought those body kicks were pretty goddamn nice. And then he got the takedown late. Um, so, yeah, I gave round one to Hooper. Um, and then each guy kicked each other in the dick um, <laughs> yeah. in the first round. So Dude, there were, some, there were some hard kicks, too. Like, those did not look pleasant. Went on. Do you think that was like an omen? Like, uh, honestly, yeah, man. I mean, man, that in that tie, I we I don't want to give away who got kicked, but in the title fight, that was maybe the hardest nut shot I've seen in the UFC. Yeah, definitely, definitely set the tone to say the least. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. But yeah so, so you gave round one to Barrett. It sounds like. Um, I was really fifty fifty. I did give it to Barrett, but honestly, if I watched it without the commentators on, um, uh, I might not have done that. I feel like a lot of the time whenever Rogan and DC get together, like they start bouncing off each other, just like hyping the shit out of one side of a fight because they like what they can see. But it's like, you guys don't see what the production truck can show us. I mean, they do, but they don't, right? Because they always have the monitors in front of them. But if they decide to look up and watch live, they only have what they can see. They definitely get this group thing going, which a lot of times it's a lot of fun and a lot of times makes for great television. However, sometimes I feel like it doesn't accurately represent the fight. Because, like I said, like, if you were only listening to the audio, like, if you were blind and you were just literally listening to them, like, do the play-by-play, you would think that Hooper was just, like, utterly just, like, trash. Like, just I, I don't getting know, teed like, off on like he had no shot. He, they were just, like, literally roasting the fuck out of his strike game. Like, to the point where I thought it was a little, like, disrespectful. Like, like Schaub always talks about how Snoop Dogg got fired after two fights because he was, like, not respecting, like, the risk that the fighters were taking. And I know Joe and DC know firsthand more than anybody how much these fighters put on the line, which is, it just it was it took me off guard. He's like, I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan, about as big as the Joe Rogan fans they come. And also, I'm a big fan of DC. And Same. I said, I'm not trying to be too hard on them, but I just thought they were kind of a little out of line. Like, maybe they had a drink beforehand, or I'm not sure, but, like, I just didn't – Feel like it's I, accurately represented. I felt like they were coming at Chase Super a little sideways, and almost from the point perspective of he's 21, he really has this one skill set that's tremendous. But does he have any other skills? And like, I think they were waiting themselves. Like they'd had a conversation. Like, is Chase Super going to prove us wrong tonight? And then when he didn't, they was just like a shitstorm. Like they were like, oh yeah, it's exactly what we thought. Blah blah. blah. <laughs> and like, it almost felt like that, right? Like they had a preconceived notion that he wasn't going to be able to strike. And then when he showed that his striking game was still pretty rudimentary. They just jumped on. Yeah, no, it, it was weird. It was really weird, especially to hear them talk about a minus 310 favorite that way. And it's not like Peter Barrett's some fan favorite. Like, it's kind of a random guy. Like, I don't know. I couldn't really make sense of it. But, um, man, how'd you score round two? So, two I definitely gave to Peter Barrett. <laughs> Me too. I thought Me he too. opened up his game a lot more. And I Number thought Chase Pete. Super 
Yeah, slippery Pete. Great. I idea. felt like I hate the stars on the shoulders, but I liked the rest of his tattoos. Like I didn't hate the slippery on the chest. I didn't hate that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh man, that would yeah. be so funny to look down and see like, what is that? <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Uh, but uh, yeah, those leg kicks had Hooper in trouble. In Dude, round two. his like, his right leg was chewed up to the point where he had to switch stances, and he has no striking capability out of his uh, opposite stance. Yeah, That's when you really saw him get exposed, honestly, last night. Yeah, man. But, like, right whenever, like, you you know, it wasn't looking good for Hooper, and, you're, and, and, and everybody watching is like, if Hooper doesn't get a sub, this fight is – he's not going to win it. And everybody right. knew it at, going into round three. Everybody knew, like, Hooper's, A, not about to win this round on points, and B, he's not going to knock him out. Like, literally, it was get the sub, pull a rabbit out of the hat, get the sub, or lose. And God damn it, what a rabbit did he pull out of the hat with those Imanari rolls. Dude, shout out to the person that just joined. So three piece and a soda. S Y L M. I think that might be Jay, but that that's is, awesome. That's Jay's, that's Jay's yeah. on Instagram. I shout love that. Jay. Yeah, that, like that's that. a badass that's a badass handle. Um Yeah, but, hell yeah. Um, but sorry, yeah. back to the back to what you were saying. So it's it you're exactly right. Like Peter Barrett knew it, Chase Hooper knew it, the Everybody. commentators knew it, we knew it. Like it wasn't a surprise that he was going to go for a submission. What was the surprise is how he did it. How he did it. That shit and was, it was slick. Really the only way he could have done it because his right. traditional takedowns were not working at all because of the lack of striking threat. Like, he could just mm -hmm. be prepared for him. And, and Barrett, you could tell, obviously, drilled hella takedown defense because he knew he was fighting Chase Hooper. Um, it, it, sorry, my phone is hell away from me. I can't even see that. But, oh, uh, Jay's just talking about Shemayev getting called out after uh, – uh, we'll get to that uh, later too, yeah, Jay. We're, yeah, right, we're big on that. You know the beefy boys are big on that train. Oh, speaking of Shemayev, bro, I had like a proud moment. I was like trying to type Sesh when I was posting like my snowboarding videos from yesterday, and my phone auto-corrected Sesh to Smesh. And, and I was like, oh, I am very proud of myself. <laughs> Damn. I mean, but, that's uh, – <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't know. My, my phone That's your phone. Knows. That's your phone yeah. learning, bro. That's crazy. Definitely, man. But, but man, so, so yeah, man, those Imanari rolls, I mean, you don't see them every day. And like I said, these traditional shoot takedowns weren't working, single or double leg. This wasn't really happening. And, and, man, he just pulled a rabbit out of the hat. There's really no other way to put it. Like, he just pulled it out of thin air, you know, snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat, man. And he got the – I mean, the, what was the that, heel, hook? Heel, heel, heel hook, but the transitions were beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. At first, it was like an ankle lock, and then he realized he wasn't going to get it with the position of his legs, so he switches the foot to the other side, puts it behind him, and as soon as he got his chest open back up to free his arm to go underneath the other side of the heel, it was over. I mean, inverted heel hook, but what a sick transition and setup, man. When it's just so crazy how, like, there's, like, that, the word athleticism is so broad, and I feel like, like, can be misrepresent things, like, because it's like, Different guys' athleticism shines in different moments. Like when they were standing in kickboxing range, Hooper looked like unathletic as fuck. Right. But then when he jumps in and like does this like body burial midair and like lands on these dudes' knees, like he did it twice. Twice. And, and, and twice. it looked like so athletic. It was like a professional diver or some shit. Just like the way he just like he like literally like body burial and just like landed or upside down. And on the first one that he didn't uh, – the time ran out, obviously, in the round, but he was getting close on that one as well in the second round. Um, he, he set that up with a calf slicer transition into a, into a knee bar. It was just like, holy shit, Chase Hooper. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I don't know. I, I hope he can tighten up that striking. He's going to have to or he's going to sure. get knocked out. And, I mean, um, yeah, he definitely needs to hit the weights, I think, too. Like, you know, like help speed up that. Because the thing is, dog, like he, he said, oh, wait till I'm 27 or what he, whatever he said after the fight. And I was like, dog, like, I mean, I, I, that's like, you got to make it that far. Look like, at all the college football players. Like, there's 21 year olds in the NFL that are swole as hell. Like, it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's about the work you put in, you know? Like, he's, he's trying to say, like, I just got to genetically, like, develop. And it's like, Oh, yeah, a little bit of that for sure. But also, like, you got to put that work in. You got to earn that body. No, I, I feel it. I feel it, man. Like, even even if it, if it means jumping to lightweight, he's just too frail and just weak. Um, but, but, I mean, needless to say, on the ground, a fucking wizard, and he just put it on full display, ends up, you know, um, covering as a minus 310 favorite. Um, yeah, he's 21 years old. I mean, that's that's the fun part, right? When a guy's that young, like, quite literally, the sky's the limit. But also – and this is kind of where Joe Rogan and them were right. Like, 
You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe he did come too early. Like, maybe, like, if he was still, on, like, learning this striking on the fly in the LFA or on the local circuit, you know, that that's – but trying to learn striking, like, fighting UFC, world class. Uh, like, you don't learn like, once you're there, essentially. Like, you either have it or you don't. I mean, it's hard. I mean, you, you, yeah, it, it, you know, good, good luck, Godspeed on that journey, yeah. brother. But, I mean, I really do hope that, you know, we watch – it's like an Oliveira situation, and ten years from now, we're still watching Hooper, and he's still young, and like you know what I'm saying, like a. But I, you know, a lot of times those young guys, it's hard to even make it that far. They have to go away and come back. But I'm not wishing that on him. And I mean, he look obviously he's he's dominant in one specific area, but I mean the matchmakers are gonna start throwing him strikers. You already know, right? Oh unless, yeah, and- unless they're trying to you know throw him a bone. But I, I, I mean, if, I feel like if you're a matchmaker after watching that, you, you got to throw him a, a gnarly striker, right? Well, and Dana addressed the idea. Uh, one of the reporters asked him, "Do you agree with Rogan in DC saying that maybe he came here too early?" Blah blah blah. And Dana said, "Look, he's going to have to go work on his striking because essentially what Dana said is you can keep winning fights, uh, but it's going to be the same end of the road as Ortega hit, which is you have to be able to defend yourself. You can't take damage like that because when you fight him." A, a, Ma- a, mo- a monsterful striker like Ortega versus Holloway you just saw him got pieced to shit and it's like that's gonna happen to Chase Hooper as well unless he works with his striking defense at the very least no I, I feel you. yeah it's definitely not the back in the you know Hoist Gracie days anymore you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying where you can only be, do jujitsu you know what I mean it's it's just the game's evolved um but yeah man um we'll keep it pushing um and man even though we kind of came down the road like the combination of Anik Rogan and DC really is like fun. Like I think it's, that it's one the particular, best. yeah, it's fire. I, you know what though, as far as like fight accurate fight description, I may take Felder over, but but not like entertainment value. You know, what I I'm agree. Saying? Like, I agree. Like, like DC is one of the boys, but like Felder gives. Also, Dominic Cruz gives insanely good fight breakdown and he also is down to argue with those other guys which i appreciate like he'll say something to rogan like no nah, i disagree it's this or he'll say the same thing to dc so i respect that dominic cruz at least will come with a different approach or perspective at times yeah i feel you instead of just piggybacking yeah for mm-hmm. sure but i mean I, I i love most of the guys that that they do but yeah when when anik rogan and dc get together it's just it's like a it's like a bro vibe you know what i'm saying yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, um, yeah it but, is it is broed out We've been pushing to the regular prelims now. There's only one fight on the early prelims, and uh, man, we got Tisha Torres as a massive favorite, minus six fifty as the tenth ranked strawweight over Sam Hughes. Um, last, you know, late replacement Sam Hughes, um, plus four seventy five, and and apparently multiple other strawweights um, turned down the fight. So I mean, you know, it's kind of cliche to say, but credit to Sam Hughes for you know stepping up to the fight, and, you know, giving us something to watch and giving you know Torres some somebody to fight. Yeah. Um... I mean, I thought the first round was clearly a 10-9 to Tisha Torres. I don't think there's any argument about that. You could even say 10-8. Uh, yeah. I wrote down in stoppage, my notes, though. like, literally, like, Mortal Kombat, like, combinations. Like, the, yes. the combinations in the Ferrari, like, it didn't f- even really look real. Like, the, it looked like it was sped up. Like, it was crazy. The fact that she was, like, landing full jumping Superman punches and then going into combinations right after landing those right was, after it. was Mortal Kombat style. You're like, who chains combos like that? Exactly. Tisha Torres. Like, Tekken. And, like, a, like, like, I was watching with my wife, Nina, and she was like, this is, like, some hoop superhero type shit. Like, like it's, yeah, like, video game superhero, whatever you want to call it impressive as fuck is what we'll call it and um man just looked absolutely amazing also i shout out the good nicknames sam page might be like worst nickname i've ever heard that's awful, <laughs> awful. Sam, sam I can't, <laughs> that's terrible i'm out on sam page but um but yeah another fight of straw weight 115 um i mean vegas obviously knew how this fight was gonna go and i gotta kind of eat my crow i was kind of saying in our preview like yeah you know, Torres, she's lost a lot of fights lately. And, and you know, I, 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 I did, she looked phenomenal. I'll, I'll eat that shit live on air. And I, I had to call myself out for that shitty <laughs> take of mine. But, uh, but yeah, man, um, Torres, man, uh, I mean, yeah, definitely won round one. And then uh, it was on top of all the gorgeous high level striking, she had that huge slam at the end of the round. That's right. That's right. Now, I will say, Dr. Stoppage TKO, right? Yes. Because Sam Hughes couldn't see out of her left eye. Like, couldn't still for, like, a while. Like, as Dude, long it was, as it's, 
Like, it was scary. bad. Did you see it? Like uh, the like, iris was discolored red. I think that was a detached retina. Detached to be retina. Quite that, that's what I said. I was talking to yeah. him. I was like, I really hope we didn't just watch a detached I'm retina. I'm pretty sure up. we did. I'm pretty sure we did. Because they were like fucking. Yeah, like, and then yeah. both the coaches asked her, and then the coach literally took her head and spun it around to the corner man that was outside. He said, "Look at her eye." And then the guy, the corner man behind her, said, "Can you see?" And she said, "No." And she turns back around to the guy that spun her head around. He's like, "You can't see." And she goes, "No." And he goes, all right, cool. We're going to get this. Gives her some water. Immediately turns to the doctor and goes, stop the fight. I was just like, whoa. No, And that, that's the good kind of stoppage you like to no, see, right? The, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because she was like, I want to fight. No, I want to fight. And it's like, you can't see out of your eye, and you might be blind permanently if you keep getting hit in your eye yeah. right now. Like, stop it's, the fight. Stop the fight. Like, it, 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 and maybe not even still, but it's one of those things. Maybe if it was a title fight that was super intense, banger back and forth, maybe. But – she was a massive underdog. She was getting pieced the fuck up. She, there was no chance in hell she was going to win. I'm all for that stoppage. She's not going to catch me complaining about it. Torres looked amazing, though, because I don't want the doctor stoppage to take away from, like, how oh, amazing Torres looked. It's amazing that Sam Hughes didn't go down already to that. What does that say? There's just a huge difference in the uh, level from Torres and then the rest of that division. Um, she gets wrecked by the ones at the top, but, like, Jay's right. Like, she literally no. loses to top fives, but can whoop the shit out of anyone else out of the top ten. I was literally about to, like, essentially say that same statement. Yeah, shout out Jay. Um, but, yeah, man, uh, exactly. She's one. But that's, like, people act like that's a bad thing. Like, there can only be one champ. You know what I'm saying? You need right. a good top ten to beef up your, your you know, your, your division. So, I mean, if she's, especially with her losses, now she's coming off two wins in a row. I mean, you know, she's definitely going to be moving up. But, yeah, I feel, I feel like there's definitely, like, a ceiling on Tisha Torres. But, God damn, that striking looked crispy as fuck. But, yeah, I don't I don't envision, like, a crazy title run or anything. But, you know, just hanging out that, that like, you know, back end of the top five or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, top, like, low end of the top ten. I, I, I mean, she's, she's solid as fuck and, like, a good test for any up-and-coming fighter. Like, you know what I mean? Abs yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh I mean, there's really probably not much else for us to say other than Tish Torres. She's going to stay where she's at, probably get better competition in her next fight. Uh, Sam Hughes, speedy recovery, man. That's never cool. It's never yeah. cool when you lose yeah, sight. Yeah, I hope she's eye. okay. I hope she's okay for sure. Um, but, yeah, man, we'll keep it pushing because this next fight, I got a lot to say about this next fight. My, like, mind Let's go. Well. Let's go. Like, all right, yeah, man, um, we got Billy Quarantillo, minus 180 favorite. Gavin Tucker, plus 155. Um underdog and uh, fighting that featherweight a ton of featherweights on this card which i'm down with bought dope ass division um uh, but uh quintillo is known for his pace and just being a grinder and, his and volume his relentlessness i call this completely wrong to be quite honest yeah man and i didn't i remember specifically saying i didn't you know have a bold you know strong opinion on this fight and, I, and i'm glad i didn't because um well would have started off man um round one tucker's strikes were just coming so hot and so fast, fast. And so hard. yeah like they were rocking the shit out of him and then he got the takedown to end the round two um i mean really i mean i gave all the the story of this fight was just how fucking amazing tucker looked yeah. everywhere he essentially oh. did to quarantillo what quarantillo does to everyone else which is gavin tucker got better as the fight went on against him i thought just no matter where the fight went, like, mm -hmm. legit, like, st piecing him up on the feet and stand-up, winning a lot of the clinch, which which I believe Quarantino is known for having a good clinch game, and, yeah. and, and but he was still, like, he was beating Quarantino at his own game, like you were saying, and then when it went to the ground, he was getting the advantage on the ground or getting it back to the feet when he wanted it to. Um, it was, man, he, it, it, and just the crispness, like, 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 you know, Izzy was talking about last night, not about this fight, but it just applies to this fight. Like, there really is levels. Like, like, the yeah. striking oh, yeah. was so crisp and just gorgeous. I mean, just clinic, right? Uh, yeah, what I would say it looked like to me was a guy with a bunch of heart trying to go up against a guy with a lot more skill. Like, that's literally the kind of the way this fight looked to me was Gavin Tucker was just had the better skill set overall. And while Quarantillo is tough and he's going to keep coming forward, that's not going to matter if you can't if you can't strike with him. Uh, yeah. He landed more total strikes, but significant strikes he got landed by twenty. Quarantillo did. Yeah, because yeah, Tucker was just slinging heat. He was not right. doing any probing. He was coming hot, and uh, and he was landing clean. Like 
yeah, those strikes can be – numbers can be misleading because, like, when Tucker landed, he landed flush, hard, clean, and accurately um, and efficiently. Like, it, I think he was, like, 60% or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, 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 yeah, looked amazing. Like, gained me as a fan. Like, like for real. Like, I, I didn't even give two shits about Gavin Tucker before last night. But, I mean, watching that was such a – just an entertaining performance. And, and I thought he was the better athlete of the two men, too, just yeah. looking Great. at their physiques. Crazy, he's five six as well. He's a muscle hamster. Gavin Tucker is exactly, yeah, yeah. And Quarantillo was so thin, and but it was weird because even though he was short, he was still winning like the striking distance and striking exchanges as well. He, he was great at finding his range and just yeah, put on a clinic, man. Um, on a night of amazing ass fights, it's hard to spend too too much time on that one. But like, I just don't want the point to be lost that like how impressive Gavin Tucker looked. And I mean, I know there's a million killer featherweights, so I, I, it's hard to make predictions as far as like the, what the future holds and shit like that. But but man, he looked good, like and just well rounded too, because it's usually on these lower end prelim fights. It's like, oh, that guy's a hell of a striker, or that guy's a hell of a grappler. But I mean, he fucking looked well rounded. Yeah, I would say well rounded is the best word I would use to describe it as well. Like Gavin Tucker just seemed really complete standing up, really complete getting takedowns, like in his transition game, and then on the ground he looked good too. Like when yeah. for the for the short amount of times the world ground. Now, granted, Quarantillo is really good at getting up. And yeah. Some of the things he was doing, like like whenever he was giving three quarter mount and then slamming his back to the cage, super super technically smart because it's like the guy's trying to transition to his back. Well, he's like, I'll just put my back up against the wall and stand up on it. And yeah, just no. keep him on his side. I mean, a lot of good good points for Billy Q. Um, and it's not like his stock went down super hard after this loss, but probably does need to go in and, and reimagine the way he attacks and approaches some of these fights, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, so it was a unanimous 30-27. Essentially, all the judges agreed with us. There was really no way to have a controversy. In that fight. I, I couldn't see a 10-8 anywhere, and I couldn't see a, a round that Billy Q won. So I think 30-27 was just the most straightforward way. Definitely. And here's the first underdog to cash last night. So plus 155. I said neither of us really saw that coming, but at the same time, you know, that's why, that's why we watch the fights. Um, yes, sir. And, and, man, to this next one, just making us look like geniuses on this Woo! next one. Body kick city, baby. What's up? And we, we had a crystal ball when it came to this one, right? Some clairvoyant cows out here, you know what I mean? Uh, oh, yeah, man. Rafael Fazeev. What did he enter the cage at? Did they give DraftKings or William, Caesar William Hill for that one? Fuck if I know, but it was minus 135 um, as well. Oh, okay. Wow, so money just kept coming in on uh, – Moicano, right? Moicano in that case, yeah, because Fazeev started the day off at minus 160 and then got all the way down to minus 140 I'd seen right before the fight, and I guess a, a little more money came against him before that even. Yep, and then Moicano went in at plus 115. Um, almost to pick him, but, like, I thought Fazeev was just going to run through him, and he honestly did. He did. He looked so good. Like, when Fazeev – have you ever seen, like, a track sprinter, even, like, some football players do, like, a hurdle warm-up where they, like, kick their leg over the hurdles? Yes. Like, and it's yes. just, like, as, as soon as your foot touches, it has to fire back up. It's, and like, it's like, a spring. And, and that's how Fazeev's kicks look. He, he like, does – he'll throw a, the most gorgeous kick you've ever seen with him. Like, and it looks like somebody doing a high knee warm-up. Dude, his whole movement patterns are insanely nice. Like, he, he like, bounds around the ring. It's crazy how explosive he is. Like, yeah. he is crazy explosive. Yeah, and he fights, they're fighting at lightweight 155. Um, you know, Fazeev's out of Kyrgyzstan, which is, there's not a lot of fighters coming out of Kyrgyzstan. Most people can't find Kyrgyzstan on the map. I know I can't. And uh, <laughs> so, so, But, man, Fazeev's kicks, like, literally, like, MMA fan boner fuel. Like, just, it's like the – the most gorgeous goddamn kicks you'll ever see. Like, like, oh and he my throws God. combos with them too. Like, it's sometimes it's just one really nice body kick that's been opened, and sometimes it's one two kick. You know what I mean? Like, he he is an excellent Muay Thai pr practitioner. In, in the excellent. amount of volume that he can throw on the kick, like it's almost like his kick is his jab in a way. Like, uh, yeah, he throws it so he, effortlessly and so fast, and it establishes range because he's only five eight. Like, he's not right. the most physically, like, looking at him. I mean, he's in good shape, but, I mean, physically, he doesn't seem like, like a freak of nature besides, like, his hip flexors are made out of, like, vibranium. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, man, just, but, but like I said, because his kicks are just top-notch, world-class level kicks, like, 
it just it neutralizes any reach advantage that anybody else you know typically may have over a five eight lightweight. What's crazy is is the last time we broke down. Range. Exactly. Yeah, he keeps it at B range almost the entire time and is landing brutal, brutal kicks at that range. And then his movement's so good that he can keep that range without a lot of effort. It seems like, like you would think a guy like him might slow down, but he really wasn't showing any signs of slowing down to the point whenever the fight got stopped. And then from like a fight IQ strategy perspective, I mean, anybody knows when you land body kicks, the hands come down. And now when you land Fazeev, just next, next level, world-class body kicks that we've like maybe never even seen before, it, the hands are definitely going to come down. So then what does he do? He ends up getting the finish with his hands over the top. And it was just – and, and, and the, the, let's not undersell how gorgeous those strikes were too. Just oh, the three, it was a three-piece in a soda he gave. Three-piece in a soda, definitely. And, and someone asked uh, Dana in the post-fight, which Fazeev did get a bonus, I should add as well. Uh, yes, he did, which well-deserved, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, someone asked Dana in the post-fight about Fazeev, um, do you think that that fight was stopped early? Moicano was protesting. Dude, Dana made a great point. Moicano's head bounced off the canvas back up. Fazeev caught him another one on the canvas a that actually woke, that woke Moicano back up a little bit. And then, they, you know, like when the winner wins, the ref calls it, they keep the camera on the winner as he walks away to catch celebration. Well, then they went back and showed, like, the, the B-roll footage, essentially, which was that Moicano couldn't even stand up on his own yeah. right after that. So it's like, why are you protesting, man? Like, you were about to get lights out finished. Oh, yeah. No, I had zero problem with the stoppage. I mean, that, I mean honestly, yeah, that was one of the most – like, not only was that, a, like, an obvious knockout. That was I thought like that a was a perfect knockout. stoppage. I thought yeah. it was a perfect stoppage. Like, that's exactly what you want to see in a stoppage for a fight. Yeah, you, wait, the fans get the violence. You know, you minimize unnecessary damage. Like, the fight was over. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm right with you, brother. Um, yeah, Fazeev, I mean, stock rising for sure. Um, Fast. There, like, we were already on the train after that day. Because, like, when you – if you know martial arts, if you're a fan of it, you watch it, you – like, it's just like when you watch football, like, Tyreek Hill makes fast guys look not fast. Like, you know what I'm saying? Correct. Like, on a field full of fast guys, this guy is clearly different. When Patrick Mahomes throws a football, it's like, oh, that ball looks just different on my TV than when other quarterbacks throw footballs. And yeah. And uh, in physique's kicks, like, were that obvious to me. Like, just – jump off the tv screen like this is fucking special and, and just yeah the mma world is, is definitely you know coming around and, and realizing that and and, and then just yeah he's getting he's you know he's getting his kind of credit where it's due i mean we'll see as the level of you know competition increases because i mean this was supposed to be a big increase in competition I said a yeah, lot of this money was, was coming on more this was like, supposed to be like his test of like here's a grappler let's see how you do dude he just like walked through it Flying colors, flying colors for sure. So, I mean, like you said, I mean, UFC's four killers, especially at lightweight, you know, but he brings something God. special to the table. That, that, that has been proven to be effective against both grapplers and strikers. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things. He's not, like, invincible, obviously, but, like, you know, he, I feel like it's going to take a bad motherfucker to stop him. Who's, uh, who's fighting Islam Makashev next? I saw that that got announced. And I oh, hate I who he's it. fighting. It's it's someone where it's like this is not a good fight. I would much rather see like a, a Fazeev Makashev or like a Fazeev RDA or a Fazeev Felder. Felder oh, see, won't do that, but I, I think I, Fazeev is at that point now where we need to see wow. if he's a top fifteen. I think he's really? a top fifteen guy. He looks like a mouse trap when he throws his kicks, man. It's it's no, no pressure to set it off, and then it just snaps. I mean, it's I, crazy. Z Felder would be fun. That'd be, That'd be really a fun, fun fight, right? Those kicks, the kicks thrown right. in and that fight. And they're both Muay Thai kick karate guys. Like, that would be such a fun fight to watch. Yeah, it would be fun. And that'd be a good kind of, I don't know, measuring stick of Felder too, right? Like, is he, Right, is he, like, is, where you at, man? Are you still in this top 15? Because I think he is. But, I mean, yeah. how are we supposed to know? That's crazy. I, you, you, I don't know. Maybe it's just I'm a softie for Fazeev. I wouldn't mind a tiny bit of a slower build than that, but um, a more you know, he's respectable not, he's build. <laughs> he's not super young. He's not super young. I mean, the the clock is kind of somewhat, you know, proverbially tick, proverbially ticking. So you know, hey, I wouldn't be mad at a, at a fast ascension, but I, I I don't know. Just like a, I feel like maybe just a, a slower build. Like like I don't know. But 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 Fazid, man, I feel like yeah, definitely dauber up. Um, 
bring something very unique, very special. Those kicks, world class. Just like that, jump off the TV screen. I mean, just, plus yeah, he's, he's probably easy to market from a UFC perspective because he doesn't speak the worst English per se, but he also looks a lot like me. Like he doesn't look like a Middle Eastern guy, which yeah. is like easy for them to sell. If that makes sense. No, I feel it. I feel it. Um, and then also, man, he's always nine and one now with six of those wins coming by knockout. And I loved what he said after the fight, his interview, he just, in his kind of broken English, he said, yeah, fight, fighters out there, train more, train hard. <laughs> yeah. Train, like, train I, more. I, Essentially he was like saying like, keep working because I'm working and I'm coming. Yeah, I yeah, appreciated sure. the shit out of that. That was like my favorite kind of shit talk. No, exactly. Like, humble but like confident but it's not arrogant but it's confident and it's also like shit talk but it's also encouraging it's it's, it's the hardest like, thing to hit but it's perfect yeah exactly because it's not like disrespect but then it's like respect it's like good sportsmanship even like hey right. like, let's, let's both like give our best it's like made the best man win kind of you know but so so yeah i mean likable guy um you know for somebody with not the best english still relatively marketable and i mean those kicks, you know, speak all languages, man. You don't, you know, yeah. what I mean? because when you watch yeah. that, you know, if you're a fan of, of a fights, you know, that just that's all you need to see. Um, but we'll keep it pushing to this, um, you know, um, this featured prelim, man. And uh, kind of had to eat eat some more shit on this next one, but uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, that's fine. I'll, I'll get my spoon ready and we'll I mean, dive into this. I would say kind of, not really, right? So it, it's Cub Swanson, Daniel Pineda. Um, Swanson looked good, but his ACL clearly suffered some damage and like there was an easy route that Pineda could have won this fight through had that damage progressed further or the fight had gone longer. Now I thought Cub Swanson was doing a great job controlling the pace. The first round was actually really close uh, for the first three minutes or so, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. And just real quick, uh, Pineda coming in at minus 170 as the favorite Swanson plus 115 underdog fighting at 145 featherweight. Um, and the announcers, and it was just obvious talking about jump off your TV screen. Pineda looked absolutely massive for a, for a featherweight, and Swanson looked pretty goddamn thin. Um, yeah. And, and honestly, uh, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, I feel like mentally that's where this fight was won and lost. And this is what I mean by that. Uh, just Pineda was like, oh, this skinny little bitch isn't going to fucking like hurt me and just gave no respect and kind of just like, slacked a little bit defensively like oh, wasn't for sure. like super on point and like just showing the respect you know needed and um and i feel like that that played a huge factor in this fight so jay asked a really great question about this fight which is how do we feel about guys like Cub swanson these guys with big names that go do grappling matches and they risk you know getting this injury like for Cub swanson for anyone that doesn't know this was his first fight back after i want to say like Something crazy, like 14 months after Jake Shields essentially ripped his ACL out of his leg. Um, and he almost got put in that same position in this fight. Yeah, uh, and Rogan in D.C. made a point to talk about that's got to bring up some sort of, like, PTSD it, in you. It, it, it fucked with me. Like, watching my stomach <laughs> got, like, queasy. I was like, oh, I'm not trying to watch this. I don't want to watch this. Like, I, I, like, I thought it was going to be, like, some Teddy Bridgewater fucking shit. Some Alex Smith type shit, you know what I'm saying? But uh, um, To answer your question, Jay, I don't love it. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't love it. I think. I think you got to get your money how you live, and how do you get better at grappling other than doing a grappling competition? Like I know practice, obviously, but you can't simulate games. That's what we always used to say in practice on the football field. So you, you know what though? I'm going to offer like a counter like argument. Law your ball it. Law your ball it. I'm just gonna say it's like it's like if it, if a professional skateboarder decides to go snowboarding and gets hurt snowboarding, like it's still kind of relatively like similar. Like it, it's not like he's doing so, like it's not like he's got hurt playing pickup basketball or, or riding dirt bikes or just some shit that has nothing to do with becoming a better fighter. I feel yeah. like it's like fighters doing those grappling tournaments to me reminds me of how like football players run track in the off season to get faster or, or seven know. on or seven on sevens in the off season. Let's say you go with down with a non-contact ACL on the seven on seven. Or I mean, you, you were, you, you wrestled, you wrestled. Yeah, like if yeah, you would have got, got hurt I, wrestling, I, I, I did separate my and, shoulder. And, and, and football was your number one. I mean, that's essentially, I feel like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, like football is your number one sport. And so like, I feel like that's kind of the lens I look through it at. Now, granted, all of our scenarios kind of don't have money on the line. or so I, I, I True, I, yeah. I, Professional aspects taken away from it. But like we're saying – Great you know, question, Jay. Yeah, it honestly was or is because, like, 
I, other fighters are still doing this. You know, it's not like they see Cub Swanson do it and they're going to stop. You still see guys going to the submission underground or the, uh, the five-man quintets. Murphy. Yeah. Lauren Murphy yeah, yeah. does it all the time. And there's plenty of people that, you know, it's not a problem for them. Um, but, like, it, in my opinion, the mistake that, that was made here was that uh, Cub Swanson fought Jake Shields in a grappling match which was obviously for money because they're not the same weight by any measure. Like they're literally 20 something pounds apart. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, you kind of put yourself in a position to get more to, to risk more for what, for what, like you were going to get paid more in the UFC. So just focus on that. I would say as far as if money is the concern, but Cub Swanson has been around for so long, a lot of sponsors. He probably is pretty financially set. I would hope. You would hope you would hope. And man, so let's dive into this actual fight, man. Um, man, round one, at the end of round one, because the, the 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 most of round one was like a pretty goddamn close even round until the close to the very end, Swanson hurt Pineda bad. Yeah, hurt him bad, bad. Like bad. Pineda was in his corner, like sucking in air. I don't think he was really feeling good for that minute. And like I said, going up into this, I feel like mentally Pineda just had zero respect for Swanson's power, and, and, and was just like, "Oh, this guy can't hurt me." And then he fucking hurt him, and it was just like, oh shit, we got we got problems. I think he was living a little bit on the on the fumes of his Gilbert or his Herbert Burns victory too. Yeah. Like I think that was kind of juicing him up, but it's like you can't read in too much to your own hype because at a yeah. point it it starts to take away from you again. Like you can, you got to believe in yourself. Don't get me wrong, but well, at a Swanson's, point, Swanson's hands looked crisp, like they looked confident and and yeah. just accurate and just. Like, he wasn't swinging for the fences, but they still had a little something on him. You know what I'm saying? It, it, this stri his striking looked pretty good. Um, and he was even throwing some kicks with that hurt knee and that, you know, didn't look horrible. I thought that was a good sign, like, mentally, you know, that he was he was throwing it. Uh, later on in the night, Jason Perillo, whenever he was coaching McKenzie Dern, kept yelling, throw it, don't show it. I thought Cub Swanson did an excellent job of just that. Like, his shots were coming clean and crisp. He wasn't telegraphing what he was going to throw. Yeah. He looked Very like true. an experienced fighter. He looked like his old self in there, minus his leg once it got a little torn up. Uh, but shout out to him for being so tough and just coming through that. And I know that his leg was hurt, and then he rocks Pineda, and that essentially changes the course and direction of the fight. But it's like that toughness was on display even in the first round because I was unaware of how bad his leg was. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And like you said, Pineda almost fucking had that same leg tangled up again. And, and, and but he managed to get out of it, and which I was I was I like literally exhaled. Like I felt like I was like his mother watching the fight or something. Yeah, you're like, Oh God, thank you. <laughs> I just like I said, knock him out, whatever. I wasn't trying to watch that man same me get shredded again. But uh but man, yeah, Swanson surprisingly gets the fucking round two knockout and I even people that saw Swanson winning this fight, I doubt they saw him winning by knockout in the second round. I did not see knockout. I definitely thought he would either win in a decision or a submission. I yeah, thought I, no way that he would outstrike Daniel Pineda. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and, and it was cool because in, in the, his post-fight interview, Swanson, he had this really honest answer to Rogan's question about how, like, he, like, he was very fear-motivated for this fight. He was scared, yeah. essentially scared shitless, and, and there's like – there's this right balance to where if you have the right amount of the right kind of fear, it can bring out the best in an athlete or a fighter. And um, man, he, I mean, it was on full display. But yeah, Cash is as the as the um, plus one fifteen underdog. I'm not a huge underdog, but definitely, you, you know, got it. Yeah, if your bets got that one. Harrison called that one for sure. I definitely eat shit on this one. I, I was not feeling <laughs> Swanson. And then I felt pretty, especially when I, at the very beginning of the fight, when I saw how big Pineda looked, and I was like, oh, yeah, your boy's going to look like a genius <laughs> on this one. <laughs> Dude, uh, I had a – takes exposed, uh, but yeah. I had a buddy last night that went in like 520 bucks total on all the picks because he just bet 100 across and everything and then 20 on each parlay. Shit, damn, yeah. that's what's up, man. So these bet these bet picks are no longer hypothetical. We officially make a motherfucker's money out here. You know yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the homeboy paid his rent last night with that. That's awesome. That's awesome. But yeah, man, Swanson looked great. They said that he looked great. The knee did not look great. Um, mm -hmm. and at his age, you know, especially at that weight class, it's hard, you know, to really try to predict what what's next. But I, I would say the miles kind of worry me on Cub Swanson, and if his knee already got. I don't know how healed it was. I would assume after that long amount of time that it was fully healed, but it seems like it might have repopped or gotten like torn partially. Something was wrong with it, clearly. Clearly. Yeah, and and, and, and you know, um, 
I'll say this though: if he would have lost, the future would have been probably very clear for him. So, uh, the, as dark as the night and as clear as the day, if that makes so, sense. Like so, it was so, yeah. over. So yeah, he got the win. So who who knows what that means? You know, next for Cubs Swanson. But if he would have lost, we definitely would have known what was next for Cubs Swanson, especially in the cutting season that the UFC is currently finds themselves. Yeah, in. Yeah, he kind of saved his whole career in the UFC by winning this fight because uh, Dana did allude to. Uh, that as well in the post-fight press conference, which uh, they asked him, do you see guys um, – we'll get to it because I don't want to give away any results from the main card. But they essentially asked him, do you see some of these older guys getting taken out of the out of the, the UFC uh, with all these cuts? And he was like – he openly said, yeah, the goal is to get some of these older names out and to promote some of these younger rising stars. Like he openly said it last night. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. But it makes yeah. sense, but, you know. But the he, NFL's he's not, been openly saying that. And the NFL minute. is not working to keep their vets on whenever their de- their performance declines. Like, it's all performance-based. You know what I mean? Like, when they start to see them decline, and they money get them out. The, more, yeah. the, long, the older guys cost more, yeah. And to, That's oh, true the for NFL, the UFC as well, with the, the Reebok NFL deal or the Venom deal. The NFL perfected that business model. Look at the running back position in the NFL. Oh, my God. If you're, 30, if you're 32, you don't run it. You run through them like a disposable razor. You know what I'm saying? Just get you another tough. one. Just, it's yeah, so no, tough, it, man. But, All right, man. It is main card time. And when I say main card time, I mean main card time because, man, last night, UFC 256, one of the best main cards of the year. I know I'd be saying that shit all the time, but for I'm not going to say the best because, but no, seriously, one of the best main cards of Hall of 2020, which has given us a fuck ton of main cards. Um, it was just absolutely phenomenal. Everything you pretty much want, it provided. You know, usually prelims and McGee, as we used to like to, as we like to call it. But man, last night was all about this main card, beefy main card. And let's get my brother back on here with me. Let's get here. So. You said it, bro. Beefy main card. Like, there is so much to get into. Beyond even just the 10 fighters that fought, it, the ramifications for divisions, the career ramifications for a couple of these people. I mean, what a main card. What a yeah, main card. what a main card. And, I mean, uh, when a main card start, starts out with ranked heavyweights as the first Dude, fight, I mean, right? Yeah, what more can you ask for, right? I mean, Cyril, Cyril Gaon which I'm pretty sure it's gone, not Gane, as, as John Anik went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on. I know, Anik, for those that don't know what we're talking about, Anik made this, like, super insightful, like, Instagram post that shows, like, how they get the name pronunciations. Like, the fighters actually send, like, an audio of them saying their own name so that, like, they know how to pronounce it, which I think is a phenomenal idea. It's the, the best idea, for sure, because, like, who knows their name better than them? And then so Anik on Instagram like played the actual like file on the video and was and they said Gane and it was it was him saying his own name and he said Gane. Yeah, and Cyril like, Gane. So I'm gonna call him Gane. And then when it, the fight started, he was like, "Damn, he didn't follow through." <laughs> I, I he like, got cold feet. <laughs> I was like probably more disappointed than I should have been. I was like, "My man, I thought that post was so cool." And then it comes time, and you didn't even do it. So I don't know if you got some new information or what. I'm going to say Gane because I'm not going to welch out like Anik did. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, Cyril Cyril Gane, uh, ranked 14, looking for, I believe, his second fight in the UFC, even though he's been signed for about 18 months. Um, They just can't. Four fights fall out, right? Yeah, 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 literally in the last year, four fights, whether it be injury, uh, COVID, uh, all, all kinds of crazy shit. Can't hold um, that against him, you know what I mean? Really not his fault. Uh, I thought there might be a little bit of rust because he had been, you know, training in and out of the camp so much. But, man, it didn't look like it because he was fighting Junior Dos Santos. Uh, I had gone at minus 455. Yep, that's what I And Dos Santos at plus 355. Yep. Perfect. And JDS still holds the number seven ranking in the division. So this yep. is a really, really impactful fight for Gane here. It uh, really is. It JDS really is. coming into this fight had lost his last three by KO. And I think – there's this thing with heavyweights, and tell me if I'm wrong or if you disagree, okay. but there's a thing with heavyweights where they get to a certain point, and it, all they have is their power. They have no, none of their other skills. They've all deteriorated to a point where they're not really where they should be, 
but they saw this crazy power in their hands, so they can knock challengers out, but essentially it doesn't happen. And then I, my second part of that theory is when you see these old heavyweights take two KOs in a row, it's going to be a string of KOs from there on out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I'm a big – just knowing what I know about concussions and things like that from playing football and stuff, like once – I've seen it in football a million times. Like you either get concussions or you don't. Like, And, and I know fighting mm-hmm. is different, but like once a guy starts getting them, they keep getting them. And then some like Luke, Luke, never... Luke Keekley is a perfect example for big NFL fans that follow us. Like <laughs> yeah. Yep. Can't avoid it. Yeah, there's certain guys that are just like I don't know. It's like, but in fighting, the term I guess is like softens the chin, right? That's what they say. Like over right. over time, like multiple knockouts, you know, you 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 go you go out easier. That's like conventional fight wisdom. Kind of I don't know if it's I don't know the exact science behind it, but I, it seems to hold true in a lot of instances. Um, right. And, I mean, it absolutely and, is true. I think. And, and that's why. And I talked about this. I think last week. I know it was in the preview. Um, I, about how the, I think that it's a misconception that, that heavyweights can fight good older. I think they do, but I, right. I, I think I think you see it like they do fight, but I don't think that means that like they like perform better because they're heavyweights. Like I think they look like shit most of the time. I honestly, man, <laughs> I a thousand percent agree with you. That's what my whole theory is. Essentially, is that like people give them that benefit of the doubt, like oh, because they have one shot KO power, still they can still fight, and it's like. Their timing is gone. Their defense is gone. They can't – like, their cardio's getting zapped. Why yeah, are we putting I, these guys I, out there to get butchered like that? That's kind of how I feel. And low-key, I, I feel like DC kind of talks out both sides of his neck on this subject. Cause I'm yeah, he him. does. Yeah, he does. Because <laughs> he'll be like he'll, – he'll say the generic corny, like, thing of, like, oh, heavyweights fight good in their 40s. And then he'll come out, like, the very next sentence and be like, oh, man, by the time I was, you know, 38, I – my reaction time was was dog shit. Yeah, like, he, uh, he he consistently <laughs> says for anyone that wants to find proof, it's on his show with Elwani all the time. He talks about in his last fight with Stipe, a lot of those shots don't land if he's thirty six, thirty seven. He says but now it, that like, he's forty. Yeah, yeah, like it's almost like he's crutched to defend why he lost. <laughs> Shout out DC, um, John Jones, best of all time. Um, <laughs> but like he's he's not wrong when he says that. Like he is being truthful, and that's accurate. That your reaction time does slow. Your muscle response lowers. Like, you're just not as explosive. And your chin softens. But right. He'll, he'll come out and be like, oh, but these, these guys, you know, they're older, but they're heavyweights, you know. <laughs> right. Like, heavyweights can still bang. And it's like, oh, okay, great. Like, they still have power to throw because they weigh 250 pounds. But you just gave me a whole litany of reasons why they shouldn't be fighting. So which is it? Yeah, it's like if you have an old, shitty, like, pickup truck that, like, barely runs, that looks like fucking Mater from cars, but, like, you can still like crash it into something, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it yeah. doesn't mean that it's like that's a good truck. But uh, but yeah, man. Anyway, this this fight was more about Gane than it was about Dos Santos. And I honestly, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it: Dos Santos shouldn't have really been ranked seven after three knockouts. No, three KO kind of, losses. Like, what the fuck I, are we talking about? That's purely name and cachet and trying to sell tickets back when you could sell tickets but like you know what i'm saying that's what that reeks up to me i don't really like that um but best case scenario for gane right because it's like you get to fight the number seven without fighting the body of a number seven ring right i don't like for so it's like, for, for cyril this is the best possible fight they could give him it's a guy I, I, that is on his deathbed on his way out like essentially they put jds on a stretcher and we're like carrying him out and they're like you want to hit him one more time for this ranking and he was like yeah, I do want to do that. Like, that's how it felt to me, man. This felt like – and, like, JDS's attitude coming into the fight, this was uh, – one of my parlay picks was actually Gane by a finish, right? Not even to win, but he actually had to finish him. And I was ultra confident about that yeah. pick. Ultra yeah. confident. That, that's how this fight was going to go down. Like You just that, knew it. You just yeah, that, knew it. That's how this fight was going to go down. Um, yeah, man. I mean, so, yeah. But, and also – I don't have issue like how we keep saying this is a dream, you know, fight for, for like a perfect fight to give Gane. I think after having four fights fall out, he kind of deserves that. He, he earned it. Yeah, out. he's put in four camps, five now. Like, give him a fight that's meaningful. So, so yeah, I'm all for it on all fronts, really, besides the JGS front. But fuck it, you know. What I'm so saying? <laughs> okay, so this fight, it, this fight, Gane, spoiler alert, wins by TKO in the second round. But there's a lot to get into within that, right? Because yeah, the first yeah. round. A lot of kicks, a lot of keeping the distance. JDS looks slow as fuck in the first round. It's obviously embarrassing. Um, 
10 9 Ghana. There's no questions, I don't think. Did, well, what, man, did you score it for Ghana? Of course, of course. But, man, I, I want to say, and this gets thrown around way too much, but this is like an actual example of it. Ghana is a heavyweight that moves like a middleweight. And, like, they say, Bro, he reminds me of Nganu. Here, I tell everyone he's like a small Nganu that has better footwork. And people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that, but, like, you could see it, right? I thought he was way more like technical, like with you know what? He might be closer like to Overeem. He might be closer to Overeem than Ngannou. Yeah, the kicks, because I don't think Ngannou's like throwing kicks like that. Um, that's a good point. But but because because like that's what I have in my notes was that in round one, Gane in a way kind of pointed him with kicks, right? And, which how often do you see that from a heavyweight? Like never. Like he com- he mess? completely he completely felt out the style. It was masterful, honestly. And like the bounce in his feet, you don't see from heavyweights. Like he. Like I said, if I hear one more fat fuck say that he moves like a middleweight, I'm gonna fucking lose it. But like, well, and like Gane has abs. Like he literally looks like a fucking oh, like Under Armour like mannequin he, or some he's shit. He's shredded. Like, That's why he reminds me of like an Overeem or a yeah. Ganu is Physique because wise. like you're right. He is like built to be. I think he weighs two forty five roughly. I think two, yeah. There you go. So like he's not he's cutting weight. Not cutting, and he is built to be that size like he's a k1 grand prix champion so he's probably just like over him i don't know why i didn't think of that sooner but but yeah man like he's he's phys- physically built to be a heavyweight like he's a real heavyweight he doesn't add weight he doesn't get swole and be short like he's a big dude and that's where he would fight no matter what he could never make 205 yeah yeah he has abs without cutting weight like as a like, heavyweight. Like, like what do you like what do you want from him what do you want from him genetic, you know what i mean yeah no genetic freak for sure like, he's a linebacker in the NFL, essentially. Yeah, definitely. But the, the thing that's crazy is, I mean, how often do we see a guy with these, you know, great physiques come in and just try to, you know, brute force it or swing for the fences? He was like a point fighter. He was, like, super uber technical and patient and, like, just willing to, you know, sit on the outside and, and, and tap him up all day. Um, but then, you know, in round two, let's get to the – what some may call controversial. So know, that's thing. what you, perfect. I'm glad. I'm so happy you said it just like that because yeah. people say it's controversial. For me, it's not at all. No, because like, all right. So so what we're getting at? There was like an L, like a sequence where he like landed and he. They're he in had, a clinch. He has he has his head in a clinch, right? And he has his elbow lined up, and he's about to throw it. Just sorry to set the scene for you. No, but even before that, he had JDS hurt from a stiff ass jab. Like that jab was jab. stiff. Yeah, so, so he was already wobbly, and then exactly what you just said took place. And then, so yeah, he he lands this bow to what I deem maybe like right here. here. Like I would say, right behind the ear, but that's legal. Like he touched the ear with the elbow. It just the the final point of contact was maybe there. And it's JDS's fault because JDS did this. He t- that's that's my whole point is that JDS literally turned his head to try and make it the back of his head. Like, it's not how it works. You can't do that. You can't that's do not that. how it works. Exactly. That's like if I'm like a blitzing linebacker, I literally run and just throw my back at a lineman trying to get a block in the back penalty. Like, you're not getting that call. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like, like if you spun your back and then fell forward, like it's not soccer, man. You don't get to flop. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean. It, but I mean, I'll say it was scary. Like when I, I like when, it, when you saw like the head like reverberate off the elbow, it was a massive elbow to the oh, side of the head. It, and he, his like, whole forearm right landed. Down. I mean, his whole forearm landed. Like it was a super clean elbow that he posed and had the back of the other side of his face so he could pull into. Yeah. I mean, it was a tough elbow. And when yeah. someone weighs two forty five, Jack. 240 bad no it was it was gnarly that that knocks out almost any human being mm-hmm. uh, much, much less an old guy like dos santos and then but also so i didn't like that dos santos was kind of like protesting dude like, he's taken away from a young guy's win like he, the, like that should be a moment where Cyril gane is like hell yeah like i'm the man i'm here to be in the top 10 i'm here to like make my name meanwhile jds is like no i i could beat him if that illegal strike didn't touch me and it's like Bro, you caused it to be to the back of your head. You're yeah. never going to beat him anyway because he could outpoint you for three rounds straight, and we oh, all yeah. saw it in the first round. Yes. And you're just old as shit, dude. Like, take your money and get the fuck out. Like, I'm really at that point. I'm really that, at that I point. I mean, he's probably done. Like, in, in the mood that Dana's been in, like, the what they're oh, doing with the old guys, he's probably so, done. Happy you brought that up. They asked Dana specifically oh, about on, JDS last it. night. They asked him specifically, with those cuts, you think JDS one of those guys? And then, then, and then they caveated that with with his four knockout losses. And Dana White said, "I don't want to see JDS fight again. I won't let him. So he's done. He's, he's done? UFC okay. done. Yeah. I mean, I mean, honestly, I'm all for it. I'm all for it, man. Like, 
Yeah. It's like nobody's trying to watch Brett F- Jets Brett Favre. You know what no, I mean? dude, that's a wisp of dust in the backfield. Like, why do I want to watch that? I feel bad when he gets sacked. No, I feel it. And like, I know. Sorry, I'm killing y'all with the football met- metaphors today. It's but, great, uh, though. I, I mean, football's America's sport. So for any Americans that can't get with it, I feel what do you want me to I, do? I feel you. What can you do, man? But yeah, Gane. So I mean, Gane. His next fight, the matchmaking on that's going to be crazy interesting because we all know heavyweight isn't that deep and it's like set up for fast ascensions, and we all know. Like and then there's like he just beat number seven. I know who you gave him. Who? Probably Walt Harris. You probably he probably gets ranked in front of Walt Harris from this win, and they're probably like he's probably nine. Walt Harris probably eleven, and then you test him with a guy that's not necessarily as old, but doesn't have as much of a name, but presents more of a threat. And you make sure he solidifies his position. Then you give him a top five. He beats so, the top so, five. So you don't th- you don't think he jumps the top five? Because that's where I was gonna go. Maybe I'm hot taking it. But, but I was going to go top five. I mean, if you beat seven convincingly as fuck, even though it was kind of a, you know, questionable seven. But you can't factor that in, I feel like, in the matchmaking. Like, you got to treat that seven like it's real for the sake of, like. Yeah, but, it, oh, man, it's so true. And Nick Maynard does the matchmaking for 205 heavyweight, 125, 135, and then Sean Shelby gets everything in between. So this is going to be a Nick Maynard special, but. Yeah, I mean, they don't have a lot of blood in the heavyweights. He'll probably That's what I'm getting, saying. He'll probably end up getting, like, an Overeem, who's, like, number five, I think. And him and Overeem are going to have a fucking war. That's going to be yeah. a sick fight. I will be. Yeah, like, he's, like, fighting, like, an older version of himself. It's it's, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's cool, man. I'd be, I'd be here for that. But, I mean, so, yeah, Gane, excited, heavyweight. And, I mean, I feel like they're kind of overhyping how young he is. That like, like, he's 30. I mean, I'm not saying he's old, but, like, they attach, they act like he's like Chase Hooper. Like, I don't know. Well, dude, I guess, you know what? This brings us, all, it's all about the heavyweight division. It's yeah, literally about the division it. in which I he knew. fights. It's, and it's disgusting because you could have a heavyweight at 26 maul all the other heavyweights. Like, that doesn't matter, right? Because I think at 25, most men are like really physically developed and they're there. They may not be mentally there, but well, physically, it, you're going to be as good as you want to be. And if you have a heavyweight, you can finish somebody. So at that point, it kind of yeah. like becomes irrelevant. Like, uh, but yeah, I, I feel you, man. So I mean, I, I'm excited about Gane. Like I said, I mean, we'll see. We'll see, man. We'll see. Like, I feel like we didn't learn. I mean, we learned that he he has very crisp striking. But like I said, who who he was fighting and like, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I, we'll, like, I, I don't. I don't think that that fight was supposed to be the fight that tells us if he's the real deal. I I feel like I, I I'm still kind of like I need one more. Like I'm not. So I mean, obviously he's good, but so let's talk about this real fast. Who is ahead of him from six to champion at heavyweight? It's it's going to be Blades, Lewis, Volkov, Rosenstroik, Stipe. Um, the, the winner. The, do, do they Overeem. The winner of That's Blades probably them. Lewis? No, dude, because the winner of Blades Lewis has to get a title shot. Those guys are yeah. too high up. But I right. uh, but the loser <laughs> you could give him you could give him Volkov. Volkov would be super interesting because Volkov's you know six five, tall Russian, not really stacked out like that. Obviously, he's been beaten by Derek Lewis, but won most of that fight based on point fighting him. I think yeah, that might be the matchup. Two heavyweight point fighters that'd be crazy. Right, that'd be Probably crazy. Probably turns to a brawl. Yeah, honestly, like you might get him to start throwing hard in the third round. That's Man, a good yeah. fight. I like that fight. All right, let's get to next to our fucking boy. Yes, we're blazing trails on this motherfucker. Fuck blazing all the gators. Trails. Yep, blazing trails with Kevin Holland. Um, you know, coming in at a minus one hundred five. I guess was he the underdog? underdog right? Technically, yep. very yeah. close. I mean, that's pick a pick'em to me. Pick'em, yeah, exactly. Um, he was so Holland's actually ranked fifteen. So this is his first fight when he's being ranked, right? Yes, like, correct. Right? Yeah, first ranked fight. He's defending his rank essentially because Souza just fell outside top fifteen, which yeah. is weird. Um, not weird that he fell outside the top fifteen, but weird that he's the betting favorite. I was so confused all week going into this, like. Souza had one path to victory. His striking is okay, and he only landed one takedown in the last three years. Granted, he got one last night. Didn't help him. Yeah, I think anybody betting on – anybody betting Souza had to bet the sub. I mean, if you do, like, you might as well give yourself the juice and bet the sub if you were going to bet Souza. But uh, – Yeah? But, yeah. So, so I mean, so, yeah, number 15 ranked fighting um, Souza, who is a legend, Jacare Souza, you know, very respected. And I, I don't – no – let me ask you this. 
I don't consider Souza to be at that Dos Santos like level of like. Oh no, so, definitely not, man. He went he to has a split. A lot more juice in the went thing. to a split with Blahovich. Now I will say, how real is Kevin Holland's power if he knocked out Buckley? And spoiler alert for anyone now that we're on it, knocked out Souza, but Blahovich couldn't. Like, how real is Kevin Holland's power? It, it's it's so real, and it's the best kind of power. Because it's not he doesn't like, throw it like that. Yeah, it's, it's precision, it's, accuracy, striking, and timing. And just some of that, just all natural, God given, just whatever that touch of death factor is that certain guys have. Dude, the way. All right, so let's get into it real fast, okay. so we can just talk about it openly. Um, Kevin Holland, Souza, you know, come out, they're scrapping. Uh, Kevin Holland's talking his shit as he always does. Jacare no. seemed to appreciate it. Like they came out. Kevin Holland's dancing to All In by Little Baby. Sick walkout. <laughs> Yeah. Jacques Ray started dancing with him. Yeah. Like, these two dudes put on a good show. Like, I appreciated the show they gave us more than anything. Oh, definitely. But then, to actually get into the fight, uh, Souza gets that takedown in Holland. I think that's going to be a major problem. And then Kevin Holland is just defending so well from the bottom. Like, throwing hard elbows from the bottom, landing yeah. punches. And finally gets to the point where he gets his feet up on the hips, pushes away from Souza. Instead of getting up, uses his momentum... It, it, this is the craziest thing I'd seen in a long time, man. Yeah. Uses momentum instead of getting up. You know how when you push off your arm to like hop up, he pushes off his arm and throws his leg to throw a punch that annihilates Souza. I mean, you can From, see when that hit Jacare, it stunned the fuck out of him. Yes, like when people say a guy's dangerous from their back, they're talking about submissions, not like who not somebody not, out from their Nico back. Price. They they asked yeah. him in the post fight. That's the only other guy to ever score a knockout from your back. Nico Price with the side hammer fist. And Kevin Holland even said, he, he called out Rogan. Out. He called out Rogan because Rogan was like, I think it's the first time. And he was like, no, nah, Nico Price. The reason I know that's because I was trying to do the same thing because I thought of that on the bottom. Like, Kevin Holland is cerebrally, cerebrally very much there when he fights. Like, I love Kevin Holland. Yeah, man. What's there not to love? Like, I mean, he, he's he's exciting. He's, he's, I mean, he's young. Talk about, like, it's so weird the way they try to spin certain guys as young and certain guys as veteran. They market Kevin Holland like he's like, – and he is a wild man. He has a lot of fights, but he's 28 years old. He's essentially right. our age. His physical uh, prime for fighting is probably still two and a half years down the road. Yeah, and, 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 his, and he just gains – like every fight he looks better essentially. Right, because his fight IQ is going to keep going up. Like his body is where it needs to be. It's going to maintain that until probably 33 is when you'll start to see it decline from his body perspective. But his brain is right there, bro. Oh, yeah. And he has certain just tools. Like, he has an 81-inch reach. And, like, last night, Sue's only had a 72-inch reach. Like, that, can't, that can't reach is, that. That reach is why he's able to do what he did from the bottom. Can you imagine yeah. if he had four and a half inches less on each, on each arm, essentially, there to throw those strikes? Like, he would whiff those strikes there. The fact that he's so long is why he can be so dangerous on the bottom. But and also... he can be so dangerous down the pipe, too. How much like a movie was that? You see Souza get hit once and his hands kind of like drop to the side a little bit. And then Holland, like you see it in his eyes where he's like, oh, I got you. And he does it again, catches him even cleaner on the second one. Souza's like, okay, going out. And then Holland stands up and is just dropping shots down on a folded over Souza. Yeah, like, no, it, was it was beautiful from a marketing standpoint. No, it was it was amazing, and then man, it was crazy because it was oh, a little bit scary, honestly. Especially cause dude, was I felt older. just like like Jacare. I was like, that's he, bad. Like he took a lot of punches because he well because he was sitting on the bench. I don't know if you saw this, and he was like he couldn't even he couldn't even out. sit. Yeah, he couldn't he even like, sit. He was like passing out like again, like but, after he woke up, like they he, he couldn't even go to the middle of the octagon for the mm -hmm. hand raise thing. Like, I started thinking about up. it, dude. He ate like five or six like haymaker level shots. Yeah. Like from, a fuck. You no, know, it was it was crazy. Um, Kevin Holland, man. I mean, this is the year of Kevin Holland. I think he's five and zero. I think he, I think he's fighter of the year. Yeah, yeah. we'll get to it later. Um, and that might be a little bit of a giveaway. But for those that aren't super involved, it's not a giveaway at all. I assume. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Kevin Holland's my fighter of the year, man. The the Buckley starching knockout, starching Souza, winning five, beating Darren Stewart, even though he lost the third round. There's just so much love about this guy. And then that's not even to mention the fact. That this all started with him losing to Tiago Santos when he yeah. didn't Last get a contract from DWCS because Dana didn't like how much shit he talks in the ring. That's that, crazy. Yeah, when you when you make your boss go from hating you to loving you, you're doing something right. Like Kevin. Ke oh, Kevin Holland got another bonus last night. We should mention yeah. that 150 k on the year he's earned for performance bonuses. That's Shout crazy. out, he deserves it. He does. Yeah, and it's 
it's five wins in 2020 is crazy, but when you really look at like the calendar map, he started in, in, in he's you're right. He started in uh, May, late May or yeah. early June, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That, that's yep. unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Like he yeah, could have so, won seven or eight fights this year on that pace. That's unreal. Definitely. And so it's cool now because he clawed and scratched and like, just like literally inserted himself into the conversation like yeah. straight up. Like, you can't talk middleweights at this point right now without bringing up Kevin Holland's name. Like you just, you or, or if you do, you're doing the whole conversation a disservice because I, I mean, 100% agree. And it's not that he like will beat any middleweight, but it's like he can, like on any given day, like the whole, like, like the path to victory exists against almost anybody you line. He up always against. has it. And his jujitsu looked great last night. Like his defensive jujitsu which completely alleviates another concern that I had for him was that he was only going to be a stand-up striker. Like, yeah. And he even addressed that in his post-fight where he's like, you know, I trained under Travis Luter. He's a black belt. I have my black belt. And honestly, if Jacare does does me like everyone said he was going to be, I don't deserve a black belt. But the, because I can defend myself, I show that I earned it. And I respected everything he had to say in that. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. And like watching, listening to him talk, like, because pre-fight uh, Kevin Holland and post-fight Kevin Holland are like two different people, and I love them both. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then um, one of my favorite lines here said is how uh, they were asking him, and I, I honestly hated this question because I feel like it was like a hater-ass question. Like they were trying to like set Holland up to be a hater, but Holland just answered it in the gist way possible. Oh, like, yes, my they're, sons. Yeah, they're my sons. They were like, you know, you knocked out Buckley, but Buckley's getting all the shine and hype. Or, or, or like, how does it, like, does that rub you the wrong way? It's just a bitch ass question to ask. Right. And most, but. and most hotheads, or when you just win a fight, you'd be like, yeah, fuck that dude. I deserve his promotion. No, yeah. Kevin Holland is so there all the time. It's crazy. I tell him what his answer was. Oh yeah. He was just like, he was just like, no way. I, 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 that's my son. I birthed him into UFC. So I, I love seeing my children succeed. <laughs> dude, it was so dope. Like, Best That's answer ever. Best answer ever. Like, honestly, I, I can't – like, Connor's had some insane answers, like, off yeah. the rip. But to win a fight and then have that answer is crazy. Like, that was levels for me where it was like Connor McGregor grabs the mic. I want to take the moment to apologize to absolutely fucking nobody. Like, that it was, was that it was up good. There with that. It was that good. And, and you know why it was that good, too? Because he managed to, like, shit on him but without hating on him. Right, like, like he didn't, he didn't full balance. Didn't talk about his skills being bad or like he, he has these he holes in his game. All the money and all the success. Like, Essentially, he said, "Like I want you to do well because I already hold, hold a, I hold a win. Like when you're second, that means I'm first. Like yeah. it was the most G way to approach it I could possibly think of. Now, um, you know, we we can't finish up this this Holland breakdown without saying he called out Shinaya for literally yes, the week. sir. Let's <laughs> but, go." can't really happen right because like, isn't the edward fight the, the coming up in like a couple of weeks for shimaya I, I mean they i think they're trying to reschedule it for january to be its mm -hmm. own card if i'm shimaya fuck that i'm taking kevin holland it's a bigger fight he has a way higher key rating leon edwards Ooh, and 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 gonna ask kevin that, holland's cause... gonna get ranked tuesday probably to number 10 in middleweight like shimaya could be getting his middleweight ranking up as well as his welterweight at the same time oh you're right because because different Edward divisions under, oh that's right that's right yeah and, and that's I what love, he said he was I like love, don't make him cut the weight just tell him to show up and we'll fight that that would be dope i uh man if it happens oh my god that's what well, i bro have who are we gonna see. cheer for who are we gonna cheer because i'm all in on shim i have and i'm all in on the trailblazer i'm probably i think i lean kevin holland Gonna bust out the old bottle of Jergens and hey, uh, <laughs> day. but uh, but Green man, phrase, sure. yeah, definitely, man. Like, uh, but seriously, though, what a great matchup. I mean, I don't even know. I would love to. Like, I'm so fascinated. Everything about that fascinates me. Like, what the fuck would yeah. the money line be? Is that a pick em? Like, I bet Shimaev gets heavy favorite. Oh, I don't know because he just beat Sousa, so he showed that like the grappling isn't going to be like that of a, and he just knocked him out from his back. So it's like. Yeah, dude, that's a great, and, great and fight. It'll be like one of the only fights where Holland's not the smaller man. That's a great fight. That's it's just a great, great fight. fight all but I also love the way it, what talk how we love how Kevin Holland speaks. Like he, the way he called out Shimad. He didn't just call him out. He said, "He said stay your ass at one seventy. 
because you could be a champ at once. Once again, not hating. Yeah, he said, not hating. Like, he was like, he was like, you do your thing in one seven. You might be the champ there, but come up here, you get smacked. And I was like, okay, like let's the, talk that shit. The best shit talk ever. Like it's like because like I said, it's respectful, but it's still swaggy. It's not corny. It's it's still I don't know. I love everything well, about and the, the- and then even better, Joe Rogan asked him, he was like, that's only a week away. Are you sure you could do it? And he goes, that's what he does, right? Y'all put him up a week apart. Why not me? And he said, I do it better. I yeah. It. Yeah. It was like, dude, he literally isn't t- taking away from anyone's brand. He just wants to build his. Like, he is – he's the best dude right now in the UFC as far as marketable personalities on a young, on a young new fighter. Rogan needs to get him on the pod. Like, yes. So yes. And good. his life story is dope. Like, Kevin Holland's real life story – is fantastic for anyone that wants to hear it we kind of talked about it a little bit on thursday he also is in the ufc embedded you can look up his episode or the countdown all all three of those options preferably you go watch beefy boys bets on thursday <laughs> but it's a sick story man like kevin holland is dope like i'm all in on the kevin holland train even if he loses his next fight i don't care i'm a fan of his like he has oh, earned yeah. me as a legit fan of his person exactly not like a hype train fan like an in the moment fan but like yeah like i'm rooting for this dude like in life definitely <laughs> It's kind of could... like like Hamzat's the same though. Like Hamzat posting his real life and like having like the weed leaf bucket hat and shit. Like <laughs> I fuck with him as a real person outside of just his fights too. And, and, and like yeah, because it's cool like watching Shemaev like come into his own. Like you know what I'm saying? Honestly, like, yeah, yeah. Like like because he's still a, like a young dude, you know. And he's young as really, fuck. We all relate to kind of finding ourselves and finding our voice and finding our just learning about ourselves, coming to ourselves as a man, like. And I feel like that's happening to Shemayev, like, before our eyes. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like I said, if that fight happens, man, like, I, I'm not betting it. I'm just going to, nope, you know. I'm just enjoying the, it. Thank the MMA gods. And, and yeah, and, and, like I said, enjoy, enjoying the fuck out of it. But, man, we'll keep it pushing to a, just another fantastic fight. Like, like Dude, dude what stop. a fight, don't right? Stop. Like, what a fight. Uh, also, I am so I feel so bad about this, but I call Yandy Roba – or Jan De Hoba, however you want to say her name. I call her Jar Jar Banks. <laughs> and it, I feel fucked up when I do that. But I'll do it, you know, out of love. Because both of her eyes point separate ways. <laughs> but, man, like, like, legitimately, like, no way to say it without sounding like a dick. Like, how does that not affect the vision? Like, does, does, an, eye, po- does an eye poke matter? Like, you know what I <laughs> You know what I mean? Like last night she got that. iPhone. I know. I she, was like, yeah, I, I said that like, too. I was like, well, she's be all right. Yeah, I was like, it's her lazy eye. It's not even her dominant eye for vision. Like she's all right. Like, but how good is her vision though? Like dead ass. Like it can't be a hundred percent. Can't be great. Can't yeah. be great. Yeah. yeah uh, I mean, Oliveira wears the fucking the thickest glasses I've ever seen, and they don't allow contacts when you fight. So I don't know how the fuck he strikes in an octagon. <laughs> Yeah, but he does he, it pretty well. The UFC needs to start providing LASIK at the goddamn Apex Center. For <laughs> real, dude. Awesome. Like, let's get real. Like, at the PI, they could do LASIK. It's not that expensive a process, well, even. I, I can actually attest to this in my own athletic career. So, all throughout high school, I, and mind you, I'm blind as shit, y'all. Like, I yeah, I know you are, right yeah. Um, and so, all throughout high school, I played football blind. Like, essentially, like like the fighters do. And I, I, I mean, I, I was fine. I was good. But I, and then I did because I didn't know any better. I just didn't know the difference. But then in college, I got contacts. And oh, my God, it made such a difference. Like, really? Was, yeah. Like, I love like, it was it was so much better. Um, so I, I, I personally experienced this. Like, if it, like, that'd be like me trying to tell me I had to, like, skateboard or something without my contacts in. I would like be useless. I, I can barely like fucking go make a sandwich without my contacts in so like yeah no, I, I, i'm not a fan of that at all and i the, like i noticed that and i felt a type of way about it when i noticed all of their glasses because you put them on like right away you can tell he's not comfortable at all without him like he literally, oh no he like, barely can up. he's like fucking blind without this shit yeah so so we'll get into that we'll get into that right now we got Mackenzie dern versus verna jenny Doba because i guess brazilians just literally assign new sounds to alphabet like all bro ages uh, are, like, they were also saying Yandi. Yon Di- they were saying like, Yandi Doba. I was Doba? like, that's not right. That's not yeah. right. That's not yeah. right. It's not right. Like I know I, it's not. I was just getting like frustrated. Like like I mean, I'm joking. Like I don't really care. But like seriously though, like the because the R's in Brazil are, are are like like Rafael instead of Rafael. Like like you know what they're I mean? H's. R's are H's. Yeah, H's slash J like Hispanic J and then unless uh, unless there's certain letters that affect it, right? Because Crone Gracie is K R O N and it's Crone. I don't, yeah. So it's hard. It's hard. They just make shit up. It's, yeah. Because like, the <laughs> alphabet, 
but they don't. Like, like Russia has their own alphabet. Japan has their own alphabet. So it's like, I understand if that doesn't quite align. But they just use our alphabet, but there's just like a sign. Mixing up <laughs> just like different that. sounds yeah. and variables. It's whatever. I'll, man, maybe I'll learn Portuguese one day. But anyway. I think, uh, I think the name is, 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 is Vina, because the R should be an H, right? So Vina, and then Jandi Hoba. Yeah, they they kept, they swore they doubled down on Doba though. They were saying no, nah, they're like, fucking they wrong. Order they're wrong. Like, like I'll challenge him to a pronunciation <laughs> off. But all right, so then Dern was ranked number eleven strawweight, and then um, at a minus two hundred favorite, Jandy Doba Roba who fucking who no, Q Doba fucking Vina. Just call her Vina. Vina plus one sixty underdog, ranked number thirteen. So we had eleven versus thirteen. You know, rankings. How'd you feel McGee about? Over. I was about to say rankings McGee. Oh, How'd you it. feel? Love it, love it. And I mean, the, and it showed up in the fight, right? Like, I mean, it was an evenly matched fight. It was a banger. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um. I mean, let's just dive into it. Uh, I thought I thought it was gonna be a lot more grappling because both these girls are world class level jiu-jitsu players. Now I hate that term, player. I hate that term. But uh, Rogan and DC even brought that up. Like both these girls are phenomenal grapplers, and I believe Mackenzie Dern holds an actual win over Jen Dehoba in a uh, Vina in a grappling match. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And you could tell that might have been apparent because. Jen, De- Jen Dehoba did not want to go to the ground with her. She actually was avoiding the ground game. I'll be real. I felt kind of dope because I like my my fight knowledge is growing because like I said, I, I'll be the first to admit I don't know everything, but I'm always trying to learn more about fights when I watch them. And, and the, but I'm getting to the point whenever they said they were both world class jujitsu players, I, I I said to myself, I was like, this is going to be a banger. I was like, like they're going to yeah, like they're going to swing for each other because they both know it's negated on the ground. Yeah, uh, so so I, I'll be real. It didn't catch me off guard. I was like, oh, I know how this is going to go down, and I was right. Um, Shout but, out. That's what's up. So so man, um, but how'd you how'd you score one? Uh, I gave it 10-9 to Mackenzie Dern. Close. Exactly. I just thought she was a little more crispy with her striking. Yeah, I thought when Dern landed, it did more damage. Like, they were landing more, more flush or with more power or however you want to describe it. Because they were both landing, but it just Dern's landing just looked different, felt different. They were, they were more powerful. In but oddly power. enough, I kind of leaned the exact opposite way for Vina in the second. Totally. I'm right. I'm, I'm in lockstep with you, bro. Okay, uh, perfect. perfect. I, I gave round two to, to, to Vina, the, the, mainly because of the damage to the nose. Also, like I was just about to out. say, she 100% broke her nose. Love Jason Pro in the corner at the end of the second round. She goes, I broke my nose. And he goes, no, no, you didn't. Your nose is fine. Shut up. Don't worry about that. Mm-hmm. Like, she definitely broke her shit, but also, that's fantastic coaching. Good coaching, right? yeah. Because that's not going to lose you a fight. Like, physically, you won't get punched there again and actually, like, like break your face permanently or anything like that. Like you're good to go. So that's essentially what Jason Perlow is saying is like, you need to not worry about that and you need to fight this fight. Cause it's just five minutes. Watching live at first, I thought it was a, um, a clash of heads. Like I had to wait for the replays because like, weirdly was- enough, it was a knee from a kick that wasn't supposed to like the knee wasn't even supposed to land. Yeah, It was just yeah. that Dern dodged inside to, for the kick to go past her and hit her face on the knee coming in. Like, just a weird motion. All yeah, weird. Definitely. I had to wait because, like, at first I was going to, like, because, you know, if it was a clash of heads, you're not supposed to, like, factor that into the scoring. Absolutely. So, like, I, I had to wait, and I was like, oh, that was a knee? Yeah, round of Jenny Doba for sure. Cause that, for sure. Because that was, like, fucked up. It was bleeding. It was leaking. It was sideways. It was all fucked up. And then, um, all right. I have three. to ask you about three. I have to yeah. ask you about three. Close, 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 exactly close. close. Of a I round. can't believe I can't believe all three judges got it the same. Yeah, I, I found that surprising. I found that surprising. And also just, like, for women's strawweights, the smallest division in the UFC, I mean, about as intense of a stand-and-trade banger as you're going to yeah. find, like, looking through, you know, strawweight fights. I mean, just, Especially for not classically trained strikers. Strikers. Yeah, it, they were just banging it out, standing and trading. I mean, it was gangster. It was gangster. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I – all right, who's going first on round three? I'll do it. I said I'll read it verbatim. I said I'm leaning to Dern in the third, but it was a coin flip. Ask DMAC how he scored it. That's what I wrote. That's literally what I wrote. I wrote close, all caps, but I gave it to Jandy Doba because oh. uh, the, the significant strikes. I mean, but, I mean, coin flip. Like, 
Bro, coin flip is the best way to describe that, which is just crazy to me that all three judges saw it the same way. So, and all three judges gave three to Dern and gave Dern the fight. So Dern won by unanimous decision, 29-28 unanimous. And I, I ha at first I wrote disagree with the decision next to it, but I actually had to mark that out because I – it was too close to really be too mad. close. Like as, as, right. as far as like the whole dying on the hill thing, like I'm not dying on that hill. Like it was a banger. It was a close fight. I, it's one of those things where it's not like it's inconceivable. I can totally like see, like you said, I was shocked that all three, I thought it was going to be a split or, or maybe even some kind of crazy. I don't even know, but uh, I thought it was going to be a split probably, but no, it was a unanimous decision. Hey, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm probably wrong if all three judges saw it that way, but also those judges can eat dick, so. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, they can. I mean, we talked about Chris Bell on our breakdown coming in. Like, there are certain judges that just should not be judges in mixed martial arts, and they make it apparent by the way they score fights that are obvious. Now, this fight, as you just alluded to, not obvious whatsoever. Yeah. But I will say, for 11 versus 13 and rankings McGee, this had to have been – I mean, just glorious, right? Because it, these two girls, yeah, yeah. barely, barely separatable. So you know that the rankings are actually on point there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, and man, that that strawweight division is is you know packed, jam packed, a lot of log jam there at strawweight. And it's always interesting when the higher ranked fighter beats a lower ranked fighter, but a fighter that's still ranked, like. Like, how does that affect the rankings? Like, it's well, and when it's extremely close. Like, if you starch someone, like, if she had starched her in the first round, 11 versus 13, cool, we're moving you up. I kind of want to just hold her at 11 or 10 right here. Like, exactly. why would Maybe I move her up that much? And why, would, and why would Vina fall out of the top 15 here? Like, she probably falls back to 15, and Mackenzie Dern goes up to 11 or 10? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, no, I feel it. Uh, so, I mean, close fight, close just division, honestly. There's a lot of yeah. – there's a lot of – competition there that, except um, at the top except at the top yeah exactly which is makes for a fun division it kind of gives you you have your cake and eat it too as you maybe get a lot of maybe, maybe a tisha torres mckenzie dern is in line next hey that ooh, ooh, i like that a lot i like that one a lot too stylistically it's a matchup it's age a matchup like mckenzie dern's the young up-and-comer tisha torres kind of old got a defender spot gatekeeper role Cause it's kind of like I, I think if it stays on the feet, I like Torres a lot. But obviously, I think Darren has Darren has a huge grappling advantage. So yeah, the classic matchup. That, I mean, that'd be a lot of fun if they could make that happen. But man, um, no further ado, let's get co-main main event. The co-main slightly disappointing, not really because of just the implications and how good uh, Dubronx looked, but also. Yeah. Tony Ferguson's the toughest man to live. Yes. I mean, Jesus yes. Christ, his whole elbow is inverted today. Yeah, yeah, no, seriously. And I, once again, talk about relating. I've asked somebody who's hyperextended my elbow. Bro, so I, yeah. I hyperextended my elbow, and I, like, hit it from the coaches and then went back in on a special teams play. I, like, heard it on third down and then went back out to, like, punt return or whatever. Uh, and then I, I like, realized – super instantly that I had made a horrible mistake in the very next <laughs> play. I removed myself. It was the only time in my whole career where I made a quote unquote business decision, like purposely like didn't block anybody. I was like, oh no, 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 I fucked up. Like I yeah, I, like, I gotta save my arm here. Because like at first I was like, oh the guys play through this. And I was like like nope, I ain't Tony Ferguson. <laughs> but uh but yeah man uh just so Tony Ferguson, the great El Kakui, um minus one sixty favorite coming in at rank third in this insanely close top into the lightweight division and uh fighting charles Oliveira, du bronx Oliveira, who's the seventh rank but right there in the conversation right there in the mix and it coming in at plus 130 and, and this is one i think we both said we weren't betting this one with the 10 foot pole like we no were, hell yeah. no hell no yeah, and i had a buddy i had a buddy who was asking me for all my picks and i told him outright yo i'm like this is my eighth or ninth most confident pick that i could make like so furthest out, right? Like, I would never play these fights. And then he put Ferguson to win in a parlay, and I was like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. No, bad move there. It's like, just, like that's, like, that's greed. Like, that is an example of greed. You want a higher payout, so you take a guy at minus 160 whenever I give you a guy at minus 310, like Chase Hooper, that gets it done, gets it done the way I say, but you want to be greedy. For any betters out there, don't be fucking greedy. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And, like, he's asking me, like, how could Ferguson lose, blah, blah, blah. 
He broke his fucking arm in the first round and then fought out the fight. Like, people that don't watch the fights and bet on them as well, s- caveat, stop doing that. Yeah, that doesn't sound weird. Like, what's the point? Like, I don't know. Yeah, that seems really weird at that point. Just, just go play de- a just, slot machine. Just degenerate like, gamblers. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Go play a slot machine. But, uh, but man, so Oliveira came into this with the most submissions in UFC history. And, 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 I mean, and damn near added the total. Like, yeah. the first round. If you want to get into the way it starts, I'm going to grab a white collar real fast. But I think the way it ends is what's important. And I also want to know how you scored it. So I'll be right back. Oh, yeah, you're good. Yeah, so we got Tony Ferguson, El Kukui versus Charles Oliveira. And, and I think a lot of people just based off, like, name cachet. And, I mean, Tony Ferguson's quite literally one of the, like, baddest men on the planet. You know, a lot of people probably thought Tony Ferguson was going to win this one. I and I didn't come out and like pick Oliveira, but like I said, I'm staying away from this one because I saw like a, a path to victory for Oliveira. Oliveira's ground game, his grappling game is elite. Like like, and I I know I'd probably beat this into the ground, beat a dead horse. I always say jumps off the TV, but o, o, Oliveira's grappling jumps off the TV in, in a way like I've described. Like the Zeev's kicks jump off the TV. Like this absolutely. Okay. It's just an extreme, like, this looks different than when other guys do these same maneuvers. And, his uh, top pressure as well. Like, whenever he's actually on top, just his pressure. Tony Ferguson couldn't do a damn thing to get away from it. Like, he was trying to li- literally do a somersault backwards out of the top pressure and just couldn't get his, like, shoulders off the mat. Yeah, definitely. And so, in, in round one, d- describe the kind of, like, scrambles. Describe what led up to the arm bar. So, essentially, it's, it's Ferguson – letting him have, like, side control slash, like, half guard for most of the time, right, when they're on bottom. And then Oliveira just gets, it's like, Ferguson, by the way, the whole time is trying to roll his legs up and essentially pull his legs over Oliveira's back to kind of trap him down on top of him so there's no movement. Well, Oliveira shakes those legs, gets out to the side, and then, dude, his rotation into the armbar was so slick that I almost missed what he even did. Like, when no, he's on really, top, the whole just time. just kind of, like, th- ended up there, right? The whole time he's on top, he's creeping his knees up closer and closer and closer to Tony's shoulder, right, without actually contacting it so Tony doesn't feel it there, right? Well, then he starts fighting with the hands, dropping some strikes a little bit, right? Keeping it interesting. Tony tries to throw his legs up one more time, and Oliver kind of shakes him off, and as he shakes him, slides that knee out to the side and then rolls back into the arm bar and gets it, right? And Tony knows he gets it. This is how much of a, a badass Tony Ferguson is. He knew there was no time. He fucking just looked away and said, break my arm. Yes, he literally did. He, there were six seconds left when the arm bar started, which six seconds with your arm in an arm bar is an eternity. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Oliver had it hands on hand at first and then transitioned to arm over the hand, over my, like, over your hip, essentially, br- where the elbow is. Like, he, he did, all like, the pressure. two separate adjustments to, like, increase the torque and pressure on that elbow. And at the very end, like, at, like, one second, like, about one second, yeah. It freaking, like, legit hyper extends. Like, and mind mm-hmm. you, like, I can't even extend my arm all the way still because, like, I hyper extended this. So, uh, like, I, like it, it goes, like, past 180 degrees like the other way like it was noticeable like it hyper extended and, it would be uh, like it'd be like a 210 degree like degree measurement you know what i mean like yeah. the elbow actually came up and then was doing this the wrong way it was gross like yeah it was super gnarly and, and then my wife she was like oh man like essentially he got saved by the bell like if you if, the, if there would have been a few more seconds he would have tapped but like no you're, you're you like no a few more seconds it would have been a doctor stoppage it right been like a goddamn chicken bone like, right. like, a, like a chicken yeah tony ferguson bone. ain't tapping like what a no. tough motherfucker yeah like honestly like to his like own detriment in a way but not really because that's like just who he is and how he lives his life and like that's that's like who he is to the core like you know what i mean like oh like yeah cso champ shit only and like that was like just a, a microcosm of Tony Ferguson's whole just insane just mentality. Like, and like the way his brain sees his champions don't tap, so he was never gonna do that. Wild, wild. So just absolutely- how'd you score that round? Man, it's. I agree with what Rogan said after the fight. This is gonna somewhat be a spoiler. It's like any of those rounds could have been a ten eight. I agree. Like, all of them weren't 10-8s. Like, do you, like, so, so weird, right? Like, I, th- I think the first, 
I, I, I'm between the first and the third. I think the second was definitely a 10 9 for me. Now, granted, everyone is listening. At this point, once Tony Ferguson gets his arm like literally inverted at the elbow, he can't throw a left hand. He can't grapple with his left hand. He's essentially just riding on his back the entire rest of the fight it, yeah, in full mount, that. trying to escape, um, trying to get, try, just trying to make it to a decision, or maybe try and throw up some sort of you know submission at the end, like a leg lock or something. But once his arm was broken, it was that was it. I mean, that was it. That was the fight. It really was. It really was. So, I mean, like I said, yeah, if you want to give – I mean, I, yeah, to me, if I'm going to give it 10 i I'm going to give it to that gnarly arm bar. Because, because if that, there were four that. more seconds, I think the doctor stops it. So, for no. me, that was my 10-8. No, I think, I think I'll agree with you on that one. So, yeah. And then um, – so, in round two, and, and, and so the, the story of the fight was almost like a Khabib-like top pressure from, from Oliveira, but but not not standing. It was different than Khabib's technique. I, just the, I love that you say as, that, though, because I don't want to see Tony Fer- Tony Khabib anymore. I don't want to see it. This it ruined it for me. Like this this actually ruined it for me. Yeah, because, I mean, but so Oliveira's top pressure, his ability, because Oliveira ended up by this. It's kind of – you kind of got to – this is one of those fights – where the whole fight kind of went the same way, so breaking it round by round isn't as important. If you feel me, you know. Oh, what I'm the saying? fight was identical almost every round. Exactly. So I, I would just say, like the general flow of what Oliveira did is most important here. So, so like halfway through the third, Oliveira throughout the fight had had over ten minutes of ground control time, uh, yeah. and, and it was it was it was unique ground control because he wasn't inflicting a ton of damage besides obviously the armbar. But he, it, but Ferguson was so goddamn just like squirmy and just not giving up and always just always doing something super active from the bottom, um, that he just kind of was able to ride him. But Ferguson was so active that it gave enough action for the referee to just let it keep riding, and it was kind of just a fuck ton of top pressure. I know, but that sounds boring. But it was like super. Just there was always something happening. It was a lot of transition attempt with a lot of defense. You know what exactly, I mean? Like, exactly. And Tony Ferguson has weird defense for anyone that is a, a jiu-jitsu lover, practitioner, follower. He has that 10th planet style. Play, yeah, we hate it. Uh, but he has that weird 10th planet style where, like, there was one point where he pulled his legs up over the side of Ferguson whenever Ferguson had uh, uh, side control and essentially locked his hands around his leg and both their bodies to hold them pretty much in a concrete oh, yeah. position. Yeah, that's right. That did happen. So he has – yeah, and, and then when Ferguson – or when Oliveira got the full mount, Ferguson would just literally lock up to his body and keep his head, like, tucked into his chest so that Oliveira couldn't land any punches. So he kind of negated any damage Oliveira could do, but it was also like Tony wasn't going to do any damage himself in those positions. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Tony – I'll, I'll say the fact that Tony went the distance, I mean, God damn it. Like, I mean, that puts him in a class of his own right there. Like the, the list of fighters that, that, that go the distance in that fight is essentially one. It's him. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just him. Like what, a, or maybe John Jones, you can make the case. Cause he did the same shit with Chael Sonnen where he breaks his arm and then wins the fight. Like, or I'm sure. sorry, uh, Vitor, but like what a fucking monster to do that. You know what I mean? And and then actually looking back on my live scoring, I um I did give round three a ten eight two. So I actually scored at thirty twenty five. So it was uh, Oliveira ends up getting unanimous thirty twenty six, which means every judge gave one ten eight round to Oliveira, but they don't we don't know which they're, one it was. Yeah, I don't think they were the same because the cards for Figueredo I do know and they're very weird. Okay. We, we, I can't wait to get into that. But yeah, Rogan was even saying like yeah, like any of those could have been a 10 8. Like, like, I don't know. Like, so, but I actually gave two 10 8s, and I don't feel like I'm wrong for doing that. I don't I think you're wrong at all. Like, I wrote, I, I wrote in my notes, I had it 30 26, and I wrote, or was the third a 10 8 as well? Question mark. Like, I wrote that. So, 30 25, 30 26, totally cool with either of those. Probably 30 25 makes more sense because the first is a 10 8, the third is a 10 8. Yeah, exactly. Um, my jaw, like, and I'm not just saying this, like, my jaw was literally hanging. Like, yeah, just like, 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 am I watching Tony Ferguson get dominated? Like, no one dominates him. Like, even uh, you, people can say what they want about the Gaethje fight, dude. Ferguson landed, I think, fifteen or sixteen less significant strikes throughout the entirety of that whole fight, and was actually ahead through three rounds on significant strikes. So say what you want, but that fight was close. This fight was not that close. Not close. Like there was never any doubt at all. My jaw was hanging. Like, like I was so shocked. Um, 
Vegas Oliveira, an eight-fight win streak. And like I said, I mean, just absolutely puts him like, fuck, like, does he? All right, so let me ask you. We, and we, every episode we talk about this little fucking jumble, but it's changing as we speak. So, so, so McGregor Poirier is coming up, like, it's scheduled, it's booked. Like, that's happening. Mm-hmm. Before this fight, the rumor mill has it that Gage U was promised the winner of McGregor Poirier. And then, and then Chandler's fighting hooker is the word on the street, too. So that, that's like how it's kind of shaping up. Just, does, it's, does, I don't does know, Oliver though. Cause, jump Gagey for well, the winner of well, Poirier McGregor? Or, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Dana kind of threw a wrench into all that last night in his post fight press conference. Oh, I missed because, it. Because a reporter said, So we're going to get Gagey Chandler? Is that done? And Dana said, I'm not going to say anything, but by next week, you guys will know what's up. So it sounds like they might just go Gaethje Chandler and let the winner of Poirier McGregor fight Oliveira for a title shot. Hey, that's a lot more fun. That's a lot more fun because I'm not saying – like, Hooker Chandler would have been a, a fun fight, but it, it, I feel like that's just slightly on the outside looking in of this true, true picture. Like, I don't what. think Hooker has any look in. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. how I see it. Like, why is Hooker in the picture? Like, he – just lost to Poirier. He barely beat Felder. Like, he is that gatekeeper for this division, whereas all these other guys are the elite killers. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think – because I, I remember a few weeks ago, like, the conversation, Oliveira was kind of on that bubble with Hooker of kind of outside looking. Absolutely, and now I don't think it's a question. Yes, yeah, and he's just – like, like the little fast pass at Six Flags, he just cut to the front of the line. Because like go. I said – it's not so much what he did, but how he did it. How he, he did, did it. it. It's too. exactly how and who. It's exactly, exactly right. Like, because, like, man, just in, in fight math usually sucks, but I feel like this is an instance where you can do fight math because whoever wins McGregor Poirier 2, whoever wins that, right? You that They're not dominating Ferguson like that. No. Definitely you, you not. See what I'm saying? Like, like, like know, definitely sucks, not. But that that that's just facts. And and so, yeah, Oliver. And that's another thing too. Like, just let's just say that Khabib's really gone. I mean, Oliver is definitely the best grappler in the division now, right? For sure. But I yeah. think that might be the thing to wake Khabib up and be like, "Oh shit, someone wants to like grapple in this division. Let's see it. Like, let's try this." And I honestly think, man, I think Khabib's coming back. I think in the way I see this picture playing out is that Gaethje does get the winner of of Poirier McGregor. I think we get announced that Chandler's going to fight Hooker. And I think Oliveira might just go ahead and get a shot at Khabib if Khabib had any rouse, rousal by this, by this fight. We'll see. Man. I mean, this all depends on what Khabib does, right? And I hate that. I hate to have a second division for a champion that is in and out. I but can't stand I- that. It's like it's like I hate it, but I'd hate it more if it wasn't Khabib. Like I can kind of get it. Like like the the circumstances. I don't know. I um. But it, yeah, it, it does. It's like a wild card, right? It's like like it it, it can change the whole conversation at a like, drop of a hat. What's crazy is the only thing this fight did was take Ferguson out of the title run. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, all like, that happened. But which, it, that's crazy. The tournament the whole time and the single elimination tournament. Like he's. Yeah, that that just put Ferguson closer to like the Hooker Chandler level, you know. What I I'm feel saying? like I feel like Tony and Hooker would be a, f- a fantastic fight because yeah, they're both be just going to swing at each other. That'd be that'd be a lot of fun. That'd be meanwhile, fun. meanwhile, you could give Chandler then the winner of Gaethje, or I'm sorry, you could give Chandler Gaethje. You could make those two fight the winners of yeah, that fight and McGregor yeah. and and Port or McGregor Poirier. Those two fight each other. Meanwhile, Oliveira gets a shot at Khabib. And then the winner of that foursome on the other side gets to fight the winner of Khabib Oliveira. So I see, bro. I'm honestly still like, if I had to bet, like, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I, if I had to bet money on if Khabib's retired or not, I think he's retired. I think he's really retired. And because he just bought that fight league, like you can't run a fight league. Yeah, like, that's a like, great point. Like, he's like a owner of a league, like a, a promotion, I guess, more so than a league. But like. He's like the Dana White of the GFC, essentially. Okay, okay, then let's go this way with it. You already have Poirier McGregor signed up, ready to go, right? You know Michael Chandler's looking for a fight. Don't give him Gaethje. Give Chandler Hooker, because Hooker's number five or six in the division, so it's his actual entry into the top five that will get him a real ranking. Give Gaethje Oliveira. Let's see that fight. That's fun. 
That's fun. That's fun. That's a lot of fun. I just, you know what I my problem with this kind of whole scenario? Because we're just to keep with the tournament analogy, I feel like we're giving Gagey almost like a one seed bye week whenever he's coming off a loss. Granted, it's a loss. To so are McGregor and Poirier all to the same guys? Chase, all three of those guys coming off a loss to Khabib. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I. I and Hooker's I like, off a loss to Poirier. That's why I like. Because. Gregor Poirier is already booked, so like we just like that, you know that that kind of handcuffs half the conversation. But I like the Gagey Chandler fight because I think that the winner Oliveira's next fight needs to be against somebody coming off a win. Okay, how about this? How about Gagey versus Hooker and Oliveira versus Chandler, and then Poirier McGregor, and then those two winners each fight. And then in that case, like, that'll be either their interim or they'll be fighting to get at the shot at Khabib if he does, in fact, come back. Yeah, no, that, I, I like that. I, I mean, I mean, the fun part is, right, you can't really go wrong. You can fucking close your eyes and put it on iPod Shuffle and fucking you're going to come out with insane. I mean, yeah, Sean, Sean Shelby can't miss in, in the lightweight right now. In the top seven in lightweight, you can't miss. Can't miss, exactly. On both, like, money-making potential and fun fight potential and – implications potential so yeah i mean it's, it's so much fun uh but man let's dive into this this main event because god damn it, it potential it fight of the year yes it, we definitely deserves its time and um so we have a flyweight championship yes we just did that three weeks ago and we're doing it again uh flyweight That's championship right. fight davison figueredo as the as the current champion uh minus 335 favorite at fight time so a huge favorite um, I, I'll be real, I was in lockstep with that. I thought Figueredo was going to essentially mop the Ford Moreno. Like, and, and like, I, but it was coming from a place of not necessarily a knock on Moreno. I thought that the gap was that large and that Figueredo. Uh, yeah, was, like it's like, notorious FIG, you know what I'm saying? That's figgy, figgy, figgy. And then Brandon Moreno comes in as the number one challenger at a plus 250 underdog at fight time. Um, fighting for the flyweight belt at 125, which, you know, and both fighters made championship weight. So that means, you know, they didn't come in at 126. They were on the number. Um, I, I love Moreno. You know, he's the first um, – he had, had the potential to be the first Mexican-born um, UFC champion, I believe. And uh, he walked out to the mariachi music. I thought that was – Yeah, really it was good. tight. It was yeah, tight. I, I love that. Um, and then Moreno also had never been finished and, and still has never been finished, spoiler Dude. alert. That, his that's chin a, is know, absurd. Absurd, absurd. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It, it, it was, it was crazy, and it kind of is the story of the fight. Um, so, let's just dive in because this this is the exact opposite of the Oliveira Ferguson fight, where I said how an Oliveira Ferguson round by round wasn't that important because it was kind of just a consistent theme and more. The, the rounds same, are same. so <laughs> important in this fight, and I honestly <laughs> like. The scoring was all kinds of fucked up, uh, I, and we'll and we'll get to it because the third and fourth rounds are like they get weird. They get yeah no for sure for sure man. Um, so I saw all started off man. I gave round one to Figueroa. Those body shots he was. I definitely did as well. Those huge just winging like almost not even good technique, but just insane amount of power like Dude. Mike Tyson kind of body shots that he was landing. Yeah. That's a great point that they're Mike Tyson like because he was like sitting back, just kind of hands a little low, just like waiting, and then boom, we just uncork one, and you're like, oh my like, god, almost like jump into it, like every ounce of everything was in those, and they were landing pretty goddamn flush, pretty clean, pretty clean. And, and, and Moreno's a fairly frail guy, like he, I think he, like the, he said he he goes to sleep on weight at, at flyweight the night before. Yeah, the, the night before he goes to sleep on weight, which is like most flyweights are cutting an extra five pounds every morning just because. That shit ain't easy. You know, 125, hard to beat. Allegedly was in the octagon at like 45. Uh, uh, like essentially yeah, put on that's about, what he, that's about what he walks into the octagon at, apparently, is about 63 and a half kilos. So, yep. yeah, like and 145, 148, somewhere in that range, which is crazy big. Huge. Also, let me, let me tell you this real fast, because this yeah, is yeah. something that came out last night in the post fight, so that it, it might affect the way you look at all the rest of this. Figueredo went to the hospital oh, yeah. Friday night and was there until two thirty in the morning, and like then a came stomach bug or some shit. Right? Yeah, like some sort of like stomach, like flu or some bullshit. I don't know. Yeah, but, who knows? Uh, 
But yeah, no, that is that is an interesting factor. That is an interesting factor. I didn't like how kind of quickly he went to that. But if it's tr- like true, I mean, that's a very legit factor. I and mean, I'm not calling him a liar. I'm just uh, how severe, you know, we'll never. Right. And, and like, why is that the first thing you're talking about after this fight? I, I don't like We'll that. get to how it ends, but yeah, yeah, I don't that's like not that. what you should be talking about. So, so you gave round one to Figgy too? I did, yeah, ten nine. Um, I thought I thought that Moreno was showing his Mexican chin for sure in the first round, and yeah. that Figueroa was honestly a little disrespectful in the way he was striking and approaching it. Yeah. And he 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 got a little humbled as the fight continued to go on, and he realized like, oh, he can take my power. Like, it was fuck. It was, I actually have to fight. It was classic like boxing movie like script. Like the the, the super favorite guy. Walks in there like trying to showboat, and 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 then he he starts slowly. You see the look on his face change to oh shit, we, we you know I got we got something here as the fight goes on. It, was it like, felt like a movie. It felt like Rocky Four, wherever <laughs> like wherever Drago just keeps hitting him, and finally in his corner, he's like, this dude's like a piece of iron. Like what the what do I have to do? Like what's it gonna take? Like that yeah. seems like what Figueroa hit eventually in the fight was like, what do I have to do to this guy? He hit him with everything in the kitchen sink, and he, like he hit him with shots that finished like essentially any other flyweight. Um, and like I said, we'll get to it. But um, round two, brother, what 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 do you think about round two? I once again scored it for Figueredo, but much closer than the first. Like I thought, Moreno made some good adjustments, was like really? getting in there and dirty boxing a little better. But Figueredo's jab was just like literally like a straight every time he threw it. Like it was just so much power with it. Still in the second that I gave it to uh, Figueredo. See, I actually gave round two to Moreno because he had two takedowns. Yeah, and I'll give you the takedowns, but Figueredo did get up super fast from one of them, and the yeah. second one was the end of the round, and it didn't seem like he was in any danger there. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I just – I will say that the takedown itself is, like, hard to get, right? Like, that should be rewarded. But yeah, I, I'll say that Figueredo's that. damage is why I lean to him. And, and I also wrote it was really close in all caps, so – you know, like, I'm not mad. Like, you're obviously, like, I'm not calling you a crazy man for giving that. Oh, yeah. I wrote great fight, great fight so far, actually, at the end of the second round. Like, I was pumped with it. And Moreno might have broken his orbital in that round. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I noted at the start of three, this, Moreno's chin was just different. It was a different level of chin. And and I think that's about the same time that Figueroa was realizing that he had a 100%. Because we I was just like, this is crazy. Like, Figueroa finishes any other – person like already yeah he was connecting with bombs and moreno would get a little hurt and then immediately come back and like grapple it up and then keep good distance like moreno is he's a monster man all right and then round three is the pivotal moment of the fight takes place. biggest so, round in the fight biggest round in the fight because they're going after it i mean just insanely close fight you know up, up until this point and, and after this point for that matter but there was an eye poke we missed in second round that yeah. that Moreno gets that takedown. is on top. Figure it was about to escape in that second takedown. He's about to escape it just as fast and eye that's pokes right. him and they reset him. And that's why he got to have actual top control. That's right. That's right. I, I almost let that slip. Great, great note. For sure, for sure. That definitely happened. And then in round three, they're going after it, mixing it up. And, you know, Figueroa tries to throw a low, like I think an inside leg kick. Or yeah, a like front a front – it was a front kick, but, dude, it was low as fuck. Low as fuck. And just, like, one of the hardest dick shots we've ever seen, like a, any UFC fans ever seen. It was gnarly, deep, direct shot. Yeah. Uh, Moreno was on the ground coughing, lunging, like, about to puke, like, gagging. He, he took a good two and a half minutes, which is more than most of those guys will take in that time. Definitely, man. I'm honestly surprised he didn't. I would have taken the full fucking five. Like, that shit was awful. In the moment, I honestly was so bummed. I thought the fight was, like, not going to be able to finish. Like, like, I thought it was that bad. Like, that's just a testament to Moreno's toughness. Once again, like, tough, tough motherfucker. Yeah. No, honestly, bro. So, how'd you score the third? Uh, Nine, nine. Oh, see, this is where we're different. I gave it 10 8 to Moreno after the point was taken. Okay, yeah, I, I, Moreno didn't really like it, and and largely because he was compromised. I just didn't think he looked like, especially compared to the second. I just didn't think he looked that great. Um, it, but I mean, it was close. I, I, I essentially, yeah, I gave it ten nine Figueroa, but the, due to the because uh, meanwhile this whole time, like, well, we're not mentioning it every single round. Like, the whole time Figueroa's landing bombs. Like that's just kind of like right. needless to say. Like. Just assume that this whole time Figueroa's landing bombs because he is. And so, like, 
I just gave it to him because of those bombs, and then but minus the point deduction. So yeah, spoiler alert: the dick kick is so bad that on the first groin shot, um, a point is actually deducted, and that, it was cool. Mm-hmm. I love that they had actually talked about the rule book, and even Rogan was confused on this because the 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 ref actually legitimately has to factor in the how it impacts the fight moving forward. Hundred percent. And, and if the if the fighter is compromised moving forward, which Moreno clearly was. Then it's a it's a it's a point deduction on the first like no warning is necessary. I was a little I had never yeah and that. I thought I and shout out to John Ennick for knowing that John yeah. Ennick oh, immediately yeah. called that and was like actually that is factored in the scoring it's part of the rule book blah blah. blah. And Jargon was like oh well cool shout out yeah fair enough but yeah for in- sure interesting interesting to note we both have this fight right now scored twenty eight twenty eight going into the fourth yeah yeah but just different different ways things. to get there. And different ways to skin a cat. Now, this is important because the other judges agreed with us. Yeah. Two of the judges saw it your way. One of the judges saw it my way up to this point. Which is it, – it, it's all very understandable, right? Like, I feel like if we all sat in a room with each other, we'd all see where each other were coming from on on, on that one for sure. 100%. Um, and then – and then all right, so and then round four. How how'd you look at four? Pure insanity. That's actually what I wrote. I wrote round four, round four is pure insanity. Once again, a razor thin round. Um, I was leaning Moreno on that round, to be Me honest. Too. Most Me of the too. same reasons in the third. And I think if I scored the third form, I had to give the fourth to him because the fourth was more clear than the third. Well, the fourth was more clear than the third. That's why, because I didn't give the third to Moreno, but I did right, give the right. fourth to Moreno. So, so right. yeah, I um, yeah, I think the fourth was pretty. It may have been Moreno's best round. I mean, uh, honestly, because. Figueroa was starting to like tiny bit fade on the cardio. Um, Moreno had already kind of entered full psycho mode. You know, he has the broken orbital, <laughs> he, the, the 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 insane dick kick. Like he's essentially just like a like come hell or high water at this point. Like he wasn't gonna be stopped. And I feel like there was like just like a like a big interception changes momentum in a football game. There was just like this this tide, this this momentum that I felt like was obvious during the fourth. So, yeah. And, and Moreno got multiple takedowns in the fourth round. And he, I felt he had him hurt in the fourth round as well. Figueroa looked tired in the fourth round. He looked like he was surprised in the fourth round. I thought the fourth round was Moreno's clearest 10-9 of the fight. Yep. Clear, clearest. Probably the most decisive round of, of the fight. That yeah, or round, yeah. round one, right? Like, those are the only two rounds where I would say it was I, I, absolutely I'll, I'll, a one-fighter's round. Moreno's round four was more dominant than Figueroa's first round, which is a, a kind of a, a, a statement to make. But uh, yeah, and actually, man, all four of the judges scored round four for Moreno. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're all in lockstep there. But now, this in round four, something happened, and Moreno went to block a kick, which we all know Figueroa has heavy kicks, even if he's tired. Um, and, and and he blocked it with the forearm. And there was this massive lump on the forearm. And, and Rogan, honestly, wouldn't shut up about it. He kept saying that his arm was broken. And I don't think it was, but it looked like it was damaged as shit. Oh, damaged as shit, yeah. But, like, they just, like, kept saying it was broken. And then after the fight, like, oh, no, it's not broken. But uh, he did say his shoulder was hurt, so. And he couldn't hold his shoulder upright. I don't know if you noticed that when he was talking. It was not being held correctly. Like, it was, like, down to the side. Like, I think Moreno took a lot of damage in this fight. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. He's going like to have a long medical suspension for right. sure. Right. I was right going to say, like, he's going to get, like, a 60-day, whereas Figueroa might only get a 30-day. So, like, might. overall damage. Orbital, bro, if it's the orbital, he may get, like, a nine-month, six-month. He, like, he might get, like, a 90-day before he can do any sort of training again. Definitely, man. Um. All right, and then so – so, but – you just say broken, not broken, whatever. The the arm was compromised, and I mean, like I said, between the arm, the nutsack, I mean, the, the orbital, I mean, <laughs> fucking a man. Uh, Moreno's just was like, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, I wouldn't say running on fumes, but he was fucking like. It was like a car that gets rolled down a mountain, and you tell it to drive off. It's like it's so fucking battered. It, it <laughs> might it might drive off, or it might just break the fuck down right there. Yeah, the car's Moreno. It's driving off because that's what he was doing. Yeah, like, crazy, but, right? He's like a the, Civic. And then, and then in round five, how did you see five? I thought it was more to Figueredo. I scored it for Figueredo. Me too. Me too. One man. judge scored it for Moreno. One judge scored it for Moreno, which is well, why yeah. we get the majority. I, I won't spoil it just yet, but that's why we get that decision. Otherwise, you would have seen Figueredo win last night. So, so. Up until that very last little ground and pound sequence from Figueredo, 
like how he essentially ended the round on top striking. Throwing like, big shots down big on him, yeah. Big shots. Like, I had a, a coin toss into that moment. I don't see how you could see that. Oh, I did, too. I did, too. I did, too. But like Super that, close. But, but that, that secured it for Figueroa. Like, I, I 100% I, agree. 100%. I don't understand the logic. Because, like I said, if that never would have happened, it would have been a 50-50 coin toss round, and I would have been like, sure, give it to Moreno. Like, he gives a fuck. It was close. But the, the way Figueroa ended that, in a close round, in a close fight, I think is very like symbolic and should mean a lot. Like, oh yeah! After an absolute war to end on top, like dropping like significant shots, I I don't know. I thought obviously I that, I factored that in quite a bit. Oh yeah! So one judge ended up scoring this fight forty seven forty six for Figueredo. The other two scored it forty seven forty seven, a draw. So we have and a majority I, draw. And I scored it forty seven forty seven. I did as well. Okay. But that's all due to the point being taken. Yes. And but. you could make a case that Figueredo won one, two, three, and five, and that's what one judge scored at 47, 46 for. But that, can, that scoring still confused me a little bit because I get where I get where Moreno loses the four rounds on his scorecard, right? And he gets 46. But how the hell did he give Figueredo 47? Because you would think he'd win 49 points on four, winning four rounds, but somehow you could take the point away, so it should have been 48, 46. So it looks like he scored around a draw. So, I mean, I, I did. I scored the third round 9-9. Nine, nine. Right, right, because you took the point away. He scored it 9-8. He scored that a 9-9 nine, nine round and then took a point additionally because, he, you know, the ref tells him to. Weird. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. super screwy. Yeah, majority draw. You don't see that every day. And I'll be real talking about, like, learning. And, I, I mean, I, I th- I push comes to shove. I knew this. But, like, in the moment, I was like, so what happens with the belt since it was a draw? But, it stays. Yeah, yeah, it, it stays, which makes sense. You have to take it. But this is very similar to the Woodley uh, uh, Wonder Boy fight, in which that was a majority draw as well. One one judge had Woodley winning the fight. Two of them had it drawing. A draw. Yeah, that's a weird – it definitely doesn't leave, like, a definitive taste in your mouth. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of anticlimactic a little bit, but – I don't know if I love that point deduction, but I'm not going to sit on a hill and say that it shouldn't have happened. You know what, bro? Just because we've been doing this a minute, and I think this is the last – the last draw we got was something similar to this. The, and and the, the time of the fight in which it happened, it happened in the third round, like the pivotal – turning point of the fight oh yeah I, I as soon as that point was deducted i was like this is going to be a draw i should you not i knew it i did it be how yeah. close it was how much of a war it was when that point got deducted i literally like i i didn't say it out loud because it's just me and my wife but i i, I in, my, in my head i was uh, in your head you're like 47 47 is gonna hit like that's gonna be the hitter especially because i had one round for figurito round two for moreno and then round three, like I said, on my scorecard was the 9-9 draw. So I was like, we're going to get a fucking draw. I knew it. I was like, one of them's going to win the fourth. The other one's going to win the fifth. And we're going to get a draw. And sure yeah. fucking enough, that's exactly how it went down. And I think, I think the way you scored it is probably the most pure way. Because I was really back and forth. But I think the way you scored it is probably the correct way, if I'm being and, honest. And, like, you know, if we're factoring in damage, too, I mean – Fucking A. Moreno had a lot more damage than, than Figueredo. I agree. I agree. Like, if damage was the only factor, you would say that. Like, if we, if you just on the street looked at both these guys after this war of a fight they went through, you would look at them and say, I think Figueredo won that fight. Just yeah, based so, off looks. Like, I'm definitely glad, you know, Figueredo didn't, like, lose his belt due to a point deduction. That would Right. Been, that would have been some bullshit. Yeah, like, I, I, I would, that would have just left everybody with a bad taste in their mouth. Probably even Moreno and probably even Dan. And they would have scheduled a rematch anyway. So, oh, and these guys did get a bonus fight of the night, obviously. Oh, just oh didn't touch God, on that. Fight of, potentially fight of the year. Right. Uh, Yoana and Whaley is the only fight that is any, any can hold a candle this one. And honestly, I think Yoana and Whaley is still a better fight. But this fight is right there. Yeah, yeah, and then there's the whole recency bias factor and the whole just male sports hit you differently. Like, you know, you know, I, I mean? you know, I love to say that, but if you go back and watch Yoana and Whaley, the damage those two girls do to each other is, like, oh, unbelievable. Yeah, 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 like, their toughness on both sides of that fight were just 
unquestionable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm not saying that's how I feel, but I just feel like like sports oh, fans, yeah, like like you know what I'm saying, like biases when when it comes to who may actually take home the award. I think you know what I'm saying, things like things like that factor in. But yeah, absolute war. Either way you look at it, just like you said, I mean, just absolute insane card, insane nights. Just like I said, entertainment value, implications value. Did let me ask you this: Did Figueroa lose Fighter of the Year to Kevin Holland tonight? Yeah, I would say. You think I so? You think Kevin Holland did enough to take Fighter of the Year? Because it, so, cause it almost always goes biased. to a champion. I mean, I am too. But I think Kevin Holland, in the moments he had to step up, stepped up more so than Figueroa. Yeah, well, it, like Figueroa is a big favorite in every fight he's won this year. If, if Figueroa had this inv- air of invincibility about him that I felt like was like kind of it was checked. Him- it was this, checked last night too. It was. It was like he's a mortal man. Like he can be beaten. Mm-hmm. He is. He, as much as I was saying in the preview, oh, he's just not a normal flyweight. I mean, he's a very, 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 very good flyweight. But he's a flyweight, and he can be beaten by a flyweight eventually. Yep. So I one hundred percent agree, man. Like it kind of brought reality back to the division. Totally, because I was riding the hype train. You know, I like to do that, and, 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 and I mean deservingly so. Like, like nobody's saying like, oh, he got exposed. Like, no, no, no. no. He's been he's smashing dudes up at this point too. Like he's earned that that sort of prowess we've given him. But yeah, he, Moreno really he's put out a, a showing. He's a human being that you know, holds a championship belt. Like he, yeah, he's he's not some god or some untouchable like Khabib like. <laughs> Deuce de Guerra, right? God of War, maybe not so much a god. Yeah, yeah, the guy of war. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. But but man, no, I mean, I'm still I'm still a huge Figueroa fan. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I gained just so much levels of respect for Moreno. Um, I now, now we got to get to the elephant in the room. Do they run this back? Oh yeah, I hundred percent want to see it ran back. They asked Dana that last night, and he said, "There's no other option. We have to run it back." He said, and they said, "When?" He said, "2021." I don't know when, but yeah, 2021 they need to, they'll they need fight. To heal up. I don't. I don't. I want them to see them both on a fully healed, full camp, fucking. Fire and that's what, cylinders. and that's what Figueroa even asked for after the fight. He was like, "If you gave me a full camp, I think I could walk through this guy." And so then, and then the debate, like the hospital issue for Figueroa. So, so yeah, I think if they fight again, it could be a different fight. Uh, I, I mean, Moreno's heart and balls ain't going anywhere, though, man. Nope. Like, you know what I'm saying? Nope. It's good. It, and it could be a Rocky versus Apollo kind of a thing where this is essentially that story already. This is we just watched Rocky one challenger yeah. pushes him all the way to the limit and just doesn't do enough to get it. But maybe in the second, he comes back with some new tools, newfound work ethic, and, and dominates and takes it. Uh, yeah, like, I, I, I honestly, I would love to see Moreno put on five pounds of muscle. I mean, I, I know he won't. That's not, like, his type of thing. But I would absolutely love to see it. It'd be because tough, he, though, because he's so big. You know, he's five seven and a half. But he just or, – or, or even two pounds of muscle. Just He needs to be stronger. Like, there was yeah. a time – you remember the moment where Figueroa, like – he had like the the overhook scene. He was like running him towards the cage, and he literally almost folded him in half. You, yeah, you remember what? Like, yes. his body was like bending backwards. Like, like that's what makes me question if he can ever actually pull it off. Just the physical superiority. It's not the heart. It's not the balls. It's not the fight IQ. It's not the technique. It's just. It's like, just literally who's a more imposing human being. Almost snapped him in half. Like, I was like, oh, my God. Like, cause we all knew Figueroa was a stronger man. But it was just like case in point, magnify, zoom in. That's how much stronger he is. Now, Moreno managed to work around that and, and managed to not let it become a huge factor in the fight. But, like, if they fight again, like, that like that factor ain't going nowhere either. Um, and, and so, I don't know. I mean, I'm obviously so on board for a rematch. Oh, my. Like, who would? Oh, me too. That, that was, that was me too. Fight. Take – Take my money, UFC. <laughs> take it. Like I'll buy it. What? No, no flyweight is deserving to jump over that, especially Cody Garbrandt. Let me fucking yeah. Oh, if that's that the question, point on there. Yeah, if that's the question, Cody Bar- Cody Garbrandt can fuck off. Like these two guys got to fight again. Unless Cejudo wants to come out of retirement, that's the only caveat. And even I'll be real, I admit, I know I'm in the minority here. I would rather not. It's not that I don't want to see it, but I don't want to see it before the rematch. Like I, would no, I want, to I want see... to see the rematch. I want to see Figueroa to defend, and then I want to see Cejudo come back to challenge. That, yeah, that is so a storybook cool. picture. Yep, yep, that would be fucking amazing. And then I would honestly, 
love to see Figueroa start Cejudo just because Cejudo never shuts up on Twitter. But, and Ariel asked Figueroa on Wednesday in an interview, would you rather fight Garbrandt or Cejudo? And Davison said, I'd rather shut Cejudo the fuck up because he talks way too much shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Um, but yeah, man, Figueroa, you know, he, he keeps his belt. He, he is a mortal man. Um, Moreno said just, we need to get him a, a – maybe he didn't get a belt, but maybe we can get him a golden wheelbarrow to haul those balls around. <laughs> uh, but, uh, For but real, yeah, dude. Man, just bad motherfucker. I mean, hats off. I know, like, you know, his demeanor, and, and, and he's kind of a unique kind of guy. DC calls him Nick Lovin. He's not necessarily like a fighter's fighter. But after that, I mean, I think he changed a lot of people's minds, you know, as far as just, like, putting some respect on his name, you know. Yeah, for real. Like, absolutely. Absolutely. But, I mean, UFC 256 as a whole, great card in the year on. Like, what a fantastic yeah. card, man. What a what fantastic, fantastic card. card. Yeah, man, like I said, I, I don't feel jipped. I got my money's worth. I was super happy. You know what else is crazy? Think about Vittori Hermanson and Holland Souza and how well the opponent swap worked out. Yeah. Phenomenal, yeah. dude. Like, we got a damn near fight of the year from Vittori, and then we got Holland getting a, a highlight KO in which he's an underdog. It was perfect for both Vittori oh, and Holly. Like, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. It just so much fun. Like I said, last night had everything. It had the storylines. It had the drama. It had the violence. It had just the unexpected upset. Finishes, decisions. Fin God, everything. A fucking draw. Like, you know. Yeah, everything. fuck, yeah. Yeah, men, women, heavyweight, flyweight. I mean, just like I said, check box, check box, check box. Just. So happy with UFC 256. Like I said, what an exclamation point to put on the year. I think the most active year in UFC history because of all the – Yeah. Uh, also, Dana noted that uh, most profitable year in UFC history minus gate. Like, they broke every record. Pay-per-view records, uh, fighter pay record. Every record got broken. Every single one except for gate, which, of course, you can't sell gate in COVID. But, yeah, man. Right. I mean, yeah. fantastic year. Like, that's great for the promotion moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And I'm so glad that, you know, this was the year that Beefy Boys was founded and in inception and, and, and that we're kind of riding this insane kind of unprecedented time, unprecedented time in the UFC. And we've been there every step of the way. And we're going to continue to be there every step of the way. Um, yes, sir. Subscribe on YouTube, Beefy Boys Breakdown. We have a Facebook page, Beefy Boys Breakdown. Twitter, at Beefy Breakdown. Harrison underscore Madden on Instagram and Twitter. At Dreadful Talk Dom on Instagram and Twitter. We uh, the long sleeve drip will talk shirts are waiting for me as soon as I get back from Tahoe. Um, and yeah, if we still have some sizes left on these beefy boy hitters right here, hit us up, everybody. We'll get them shipped out ASAP, man. But thanks so yes, much sir. for your time, brother. That's a lot. Always, of fun. always. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. We we appreciate and love y'all. Yes, sir. Have a good one, bro. You too, bro.